get into into business hallelujah what we came here for i'm excited this afternoon to have our guest speaker dr maud marconi uh those who know dr maud marconi uh she is uh, uh, uh an occupational therapist and uh she is also our board chair for women of dominion to those who know her she's my personal friend and she's a personal friend to so many uh i'm not going to waste so many uh so much time she also is the head who had the gltl girls let's talk children young children young girls who are growing up she has a passion for young girls so we have a woman of god who knows what she's doing and we want to thank god that this afternoon god is going to use her mightly to speak to us so i don't want to waste much of your time i want to hand over time to dr maud marconi let's welcome her at this point in time over to you dr marconi Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Makai. I just want to start by saying thank you very much for this opportunity to be here today, to be speaking about a topic that I'm very passionate about and that the Lord has put me through some serious training ground ever since last summer. So I'm speaking from an experiential perspective. So thank you. I'm also very excited to hear what everyone else has to say. Without um, wasting too much time. I just want to say thank you to PICC Church. I know that pastor doesn't do these things by yourself. So thank you for the opportunity. Thanks to all the pastors who are here, all my friends. I saw some of my personal friends, some of my young sisters. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm excited that everyone is here. I saw even a couple of my students who are here as well. So today our topic is boundaries. And I was excited to hear what the first two speakers uh, said about boundaries and you are all right. So I'm going to, first of all, introduce myself. Pastor did a great job, but I'm gonna come back from a place, place of boundaries because I have to define myself from that definition as well. Why do I say that? My, she introduced me as Dr. Marconi. If my husband starts calling me, hey, Dr. Marconi in the house, and he's not joking, there's a problem. So to my husband, I'm honey, sweetie, my Matida, my Marconi, you know, that's my name. That's my boundary. When I am teaching, I am Professor McCorney because I teach as well. When I'm in certain places, I'm Dr. McCorney. When I'm with the girls, let's talk, I'm Auntie McCorney. So if the little children start calling me Dr. McCorney, I've jumped on some high horse, I need to come back down. So what am I saying? These boundaries are not written down in stone, but these are boundaries that we all know. They are written in our hearts. So we talk about boundaries that we know very well and, um, I also want to say to you, uh, yes, I am an occupational therapist. That's my undergraduate training. I do have some level of authority with this topic because my education is informed by mental health, by physical education, and by psychology as well. So I can wear many hats because of that training. So let me just begin by laying out the groundwork for what we're talking about today. So first of all, there are two different Dif uh, definitions of boundaries. I am assuming that most people here are people who, people of faith, but I'm not going to be blind to the fact that there might be other people who don't necessarily believe what we believe or who are just discovering what we're talking about. But I am speaking from a place of faith. So my first assumption is that my perspective of what boundaries are is coming from a biblical perspective. But there is another perspective that is not of my same faith. So if I cross your boundary by saying certain things, it's because I'm speaking from what I know. I can only speak about what I know. The outcomes that I'm expecting at the end of our conversation, I'm expecting that everyone is going to walk away here with that, regardless of your age, your race, or gender, with some kind of a challenge inside of you. Like, am I crossing other people's boundaries? Do I even know my own boundaries? Do I know what those boundaries are? That's goal number one. Goal number two is defining your own core fears. What do I mean by a core fear? A core fear can be confused by a boundary because I'll give you an example. My father used to use the word stupid. What it means, it's stupid. 
And that word carries a lot of meaning to me. So if someone I love calls me stupid under any circumstances, it raises a certain kind of barrier within me. That's a core fear. So I'm not gonna go down that path too much, but sometimes those are all the boundaries that we have. You put a cage around yourself because there are certain things that you don't wanna hear because they stimulate certain, certain feelings within you. That is a boundary. So I want everyone here today as you listen, check yourself, be, be ready to, to analyze yourself as I'm speaking. What are my core fears? Why do I get frustrated about certain things? Why, why is it that people will be like, oh, 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 don't say this to her or don't say this to him? Why, why are there things like that around me? Those are all boundaries. I want to make sure that each, each person that is here, you understand your friendship boundaries, your spousal boundaries, your pastoral boundaries, your children, every, every way there are boundaries. But these boundaries are not set again in stone. And then the last thing is boundaries are not a set of rules. We have often confused rules and boundaries. We put rules on other people, but that's different. I'm not talking about rules today. I'm talking about boundaries. So I hope that by the time I finish, we have a clear definition of what is the difference between a rule and a boundary. So I'm going to ask the MC to post my questions. Let me share my screen. And um, I will go ahead and uh, if you can please put my uh, first slide, my, my first set of questions in there, that'd be great. Sorry. So just post my first uh, question. So we've talked about those assumptions, I'm gonna go. So these questions right here, they are also posted in the chat. So can we all quickly, I'll give you two minutes, it's 2.45, we have two minutes to answer any one of those questions. The first question is, what is the most valuable God-given resource that we all have? Just post it in the chat. Everyone gets the same amount and it's like manna. Put it in the chat group. And is it biblical to set personal boundaries? Put that in the chat group as well. Those who are on the phone, you should be seeing those questions on the in the chat group. So if you are not, if you don't have access to the screen, just post your responses. And what is crossing boundaries? What are some examples of boundaries that we deal with in life? Have you ever crossed anyone's boundaries? And how was that reaction? So my, I'm going to ask you to sort of read what you're seeing in the chat because I'm trying to avoid causing some tech issues by switching my screens. So if you can just read what you're seeing, what are some of the responses coming out from people? All right, so the very popular response here is Bible. So Bible is the resource that we have that everybody has. Air mm -hmm. is the other one. Bible, air, people is the other resource that we have. Mm -hmm. Google, okay, there's Google. <laughs> Google is the other resource that is in here. Prayer uh -huh. is the other answer. Time, time is also one of the answers listed here. Mm -hmm. And we still have more coming. Okay, all right, we have about another 30 Relation seconds. Ago. Relationships. Relationships. Mm -hmm. And then not listening or respecting the other person's point of view. All right, okay, I think we have enough responses. So I agree with everything that everybody says to question number one, but my answer for the purposes of this conversation, the valuable thing that everybody has, that is like mana that you only get once a day and it's gone tomorrow, you have to wait for another dose, it's time. The gift of time. Time is a very special resource that God gave us. And is it biblical to set uh, personal boundaries? What do people say about that? So that one, we haven't gotten responses yet. So We have one who says yes. Yes, okay. Thank you for saying that. So that tells me, this, this informs the conversation. So we're going to go there. We will answer that question. And uh, did, are there any examples of uh, boundaries? Uh, those have not come in yet. Okay. All right. And has anyone ever crossed anybody's boundaries? And what happened when you did? Yeah, we have seen some yeses here, but no examples of boundaries yet. Or... Okay. All right. No problem. I think this is just exactly what I intended to, for it to be. And I'm happy that it's organically working like that. 
So my response to that first question is time. And you understand why I am saying time, why time is so important in boundaries. Everything that was mentioned, the Bible, if you don't spend time in the Bible, it's, it's useless, right? If you don't invest time in the, in the relationships and the people, it's useless. If you don't uh, if you spend too much time on Google, you're wasting time. So time is one thing that is threaded through everything. So we as human beings are different because of the way we choose to use this valuable resource called time. Uh, let me go to the next slide here. So you, uh, as a believer, my Christian or our lives are a part of a story I believe that is already written. So our story is written, God knows, we, we say the Bible says, oh, you created me in my mother's womb. You know the number of hairs on my head. My days are already ordained. So from that same understanding, and he gives me time, the difference between you and me is the number of yeses and nos. And what I say yes to and what I say no to in my life. And how I choose to use this resource called time that I said earlier. And I don't want to move too fast without talking about it. You have to know whose you are. My, you're married, but whose you are is Christ before you belong to Tapiwa. If you try to belong to Tapiwa and not belong to God, you have crossed the boundary and you're not going to be a happy wife. So knowing whose you are, knowing your, your personality, I always say to myself, I had a jewel here, someone took my jewel away, but I always say there's times when I have to put my little diamond in my hand. I'll use a, a, I have a, a piece of a, fruit so i have to say this to myself this is me in the palm in the in head in the in the hand of god i'm this special i'm this i'm this beautiful i'm this valuable to god so that whatever my husband or another relationship with that person says to me that diminishes this it does not affect me because i know who i am and if you see any comments, please let me know so that I know how to uh, uh, guide our conversation. Now, I'm going to go ahead and start talking about the types of, um, of boundaries. But before I talk about the types of boundaries, let me share my own testimony regarding boundaries. So, NC, may you please share my little time thing that I gave you? While they're doing that, just, just give me, let me, let me talk about this, then you can find it in your email and then I will, I will come back to it. So let me go through the different types of boundaries and let me repeat, boundaries are not written in stone. Boundaries are not a set of rules. Boundaries is what I'm going to talk about. So number one is physical boundaries. What do I mean by physical boundaries? If you have a different understanding of what a physical boundary is, please put it in the chat. So physical boundaries, those are boundaries that are controlling your body and your skin. We know that certain encounters So we have a space bubble and this space bubble is if I'm talking to you and I can start to feel, to feel your speech, you've come into my space, right? You're too close. If I am having a conversation, I start touching you. Some people don't like to be touched. I am in your space. Those are all physical and space boundaries. I'll give a few examples of what that can look like within a home. Sometimes I'm busy or my husband is busy and is doing something. And I find something that is exciting. I jump into his space and I want to take his attention to show him whatever it is that I'm doing without making sure that I'm welcome in this space. It means I've crossed that physical boundary. I hope that is, uh, that, that is understandable to all of us. I've crossed the boundary. I stepped into somebody's space. No, no, please, no, nothing. So if I get a rejection of I'm busy right now, how I'm going to take that is, oh, he doesn't want to talk to me right now. Oh, I come up with my own story. But all that happened days, I crossed the boundary. I did not negotiate. Am I welcome in your space? There's nothing wrong with negotiating that. I'm in the bathroom. I don't need anybody in my bathroom right now. It's my space. But some, if someone keeps budging in and budging in, you feel irritated, you feel annoyed, and the way you respond to that person changes. Why? Because they are crossing these soft boundaries. So it's from my understanding, those are all physical boundaries. I'll finish off with the other difficult one. Let me go to emotional boundaries. What is an emotional boundary?
boundary. If you have a response, put it in the chat. But an emotional boundary is, um, I asked my husband this afternoon, I said, what is an emotional boundary? And he said, make sure you tell everyone, for those in relationships and those who are not, watch the emotional relationships you have with people that you're not supposed to be related to. So let's say a husband is not getting attention at home and they go to work and this woman starts paying attention to them. They start commenting their clothing. A little emotional attachment develops there. And slowly by slowly, the enemy comes in. You break that boundary. And before you know it, we have an affair. Oh, what happened to pastor so-and-so? Well, they tolerated the little emotional boundary in breaking it down little by little. So those are emotional boundaries. Emotional boundaries can mean that as a woman, Sometimes we get emotional about things. Sometimes we are hormonal about things. If you don't explain to other people around you that, you know what, I need some quiet time right now. And people keep talking to you and talking to you. You get irritated and you get rude. So what you have now is a rude mother. All you needed was some space with your emotions. I just need to take a walk, take care of myself. I'm feeling a little emotional right now. It's okay. Give yourself permission. It's okay. And giving each other that space. And as a spouse or a friend, if your friend is acting weird, always take it from the place of, I wonder what boundary they're struggling with. Could I be stepping on their emotions a little bit? Let me move on to expectation boundaries. When I talk about expectations, when I came here, you all had different expectations. I'm expecting this, I'm expecting that. The speaker is gonna talk to address my problem. If I don't address what you came here for, I have crossed your expectation boundary. I did not meet your expectations. So you're going to be disappointed. That happens with pastors. I'm sure Pastor Makai and the rest of the pastors can attest to that. If a child of God comes in and they're expecting something and pastor didn't see it and she didn't provide it, we are in a bad situation because you didn't meet my expectation. I wanted you to do this or come to my house or do and She didn't do that. So you get angry. Instead of explaining that, you know what, I came because I'm really wanting this and this and this. If it doesn't happen, go back and explain. I had come for this, but it didn't happen. Communicating those soft boundaries. They are not written in a book. They are not a set of rules. It's things that we feel in our hearts and we keep them in our hearts. And there is a result. We cannot grow. The next thing I'm going to talk about is time boundaries. I think, let me finish with time, but let me go to intellectual boundaries. Intellectual boundaries is whereby somebody says a different of, is a difference of opinion. Instead of reacting, you respond. What is the difference between responding and reacting? Responding is saying, hey, you sound like you have a different opinion to what I say. A reaction is how dare you say that to me? How dare you minimize my opinion? That's a reaction. But when you learn to, to understand that this is a person, they're different from me, they have a different of, a, of an opinion, they're not disrespecting me because they are sharing a different opinion, you can respond instead of reacting. Reactions prevent us from growing, reactions kick people away from us, reactions, people don't wanna be around you because you always react to your reacting. So my point is separate reacting from responding. Am I clear, Tapio and I? Is it clear? Okay, all right. Let me move on to the next thing, financial boundaries. But those who know me, you know I use myself as an example. I came from a home where my mother worked, both my parents worked, but my, my father was a very proud man. He was responsible for his home. So whatever my mother worked in the government for, that was your money and your church friends and go do your church things. My father took care of everything. That's what I grew up seeing. So when I got married, I thought that's what happens. My money is my money, your money is our money. But my husband had come from a background where everything is shared. So for the first two, three years, we're struggling. We can't figure out why is this money thing such a big deal? Because there was a boundary that was set in my upbringing. I believe that my money is mine, your money is ours. But that's not his boundary. Until we explain to each other where we are coming from, then we establish our own thing. Financial boundaries can mean to those people who borrow and they don't return. People's money. When you borrow something from somebody and they tell you, I need it back on the 30th, give it back on the 30th because that's when you need their money back. So those are financial boundaries. 
The next one I want to talk about is sexual boundaries. I'm assuming it's mainly adults who are on this call. If they're young children, I'll keep the language a little simple because I don't know who's listening. But sexual boundaries, whether you're in a relationship or you're not, to me, to those who are married, it means everybody is responsible for communicating what those boundaries look like. Everybody has different tolerances when it comes to that subject. And when they are not communicated properly, we are constantly crossing each other's boundaries because you never talked about your comfort levels with certain things. If you are dating somebody and all they're dating you for is just for that, and you don't put a boundary up front, like, look, I am here to create a relationship with you, but this and this and this I don't do and you don't make it clear. And when they cross your boundary, you let them anyway, that is on you. So I'm here to say to everyone, know who you are, know who you are in the hands of God, know what your boundaries are, respect your boundaries while you're respecting other people's boundaries. Expecting other people to expect your boundaries while you're not doing the same thing is not biblical. So to answer that question from the beginning, is it, Biblical to set boundaries. Yes, of course. They allow us to grow. They allow us to have relationships, fruitful relationships, giving relationships. When we don't have those boundaries and you're constantly stepping on each other's toes, our relationships don't grow. Communities don't grow. Churches don't grow because you feel like your boundaries are constantly being stepped on and nobody's listening anyway. Let me keep going. I think I already, oh, intellectual boundaries. So intellectual boundaries, I work in a university sometimes and you are with these people, everybody thinks they got it, they got their big heads and everybody thinks they know everything. And sometimes an intellectual boundary can be as soft as parents are trying to talk to a child. And that kind of was okay. Your kingdom connections. And then a father says one thing to the child, mother comes in, interjects saying something completely different. What you have done there, you've crossed your spouse's boundary of intellect. Your, your spouse thought this was the best thing to say in front of this child. And you come and you just cross that boundary and you think that everything is going to be okay. When we keep crossing each other's boundaries like that, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in the living room, everywhere, we end up in counseling and sometimes in divorce. And I'm talking to those who are married. So I hope that I've addressed all of them, the expectation boundary, expectations we talked about, the time boundaries we talked about, the financial, sexual, emotional, intellectual, as well as the physical boundaries. So as I'm going, please be checking yourself. In what area are you struggling with these boundaries? Now that I've talked about all of that, I need to share my own story and my struggles before I go any further so that this is real. So now, could you please share my mind map? It's got all those dates and numbers and things on it. And I'll explain. I'm allowing the 65 people on this call into my own little space. Can you see it? Yes. So I told you that since August, feel free to look around uh since august that's when this title dropped into my heart this topic and i began to try to leave it so what i did i put down all the different activities that i need to do in this quarter of 2022 i don't follow this by the t but what it helps me People have asked me, Piola and them, they'll tell you, my mom, how do you do all these things? How do you accomplish this? You have a family, you do this, you do this. It's because of the boundaries that I have put around myself and the boundaries that I have around my time. So if you look on the blue column, this quarter, these are the things I'm supposed to be involved in. Everything that I need time with, I try to estimate how much time that I have. Don't worry about the names. The, my prayer line, I'm on the prayer line every single day. I log on to a prayer line. I, I need at least six and a half hours of sleep. I wake out at least half an hour every day. I have a group that I lead and I have to spend at least an hour every day to put something, change some goals, do something. I have to touch base with Zimbabwe. I have some activities that I'm doing at home. I develop curriculum for different activities. I remove some things. Where it says, Kumbi, that's my husband. I cannot be so busy spending my time with everything 
else ignoring my husband. I cannot do that. So what you see right there, there's workout time, we work out together, there's date night, and it's, it's an intentional use of the resource that God gave you. It says Kudzi Bible and homework. I have to spend time with my youngest child, reviewing his homework for Bible school, remove, removing his school homework. I have a whole thing that says college girl check up. It's text messages. It's a message here and there. Hey, how are you? How was your night? Even if I don't get a response, I still do my due diligence because it's on my to-do list. I have a whole thing that says professional organizations. I lead so many things within my profession. I lead things within my church, within my community. This is how I do it. It's because I put boundaries. And if I say my friends and social, I need to be on the phone for 30 minutes. If Pastor Makai called me and we spoke for 30 minutes, I'm probably not picking up any other call. I would respond to text because I can no longer sit on the phone for more than that. That's just what I do. And I'm welcoming you into my life so you can see that I'm not just saying these things, I'm doing them. I lead Girls Let's Talk. It is the passion of my heart. Three hours a week, I have to put into Girls Let's Talk. Something, talk to somebody, look for money, do something. And then I need, what else do I put? Yeah, that's basically, that's my life for this quarter. My quarter might change next month and other things come up. The Women of Dominion Conference is coming up. I've got this going on. This might look completely different. I'm not saying I follow this by the T, but it gives me an idea of how I'm putting boundaries and what resources I am using and how I'm using them. When I woke up this morning, I had prepared this plan, this conference. I finished for 30 minutes, an hour. I did it two hours with some students. I showered and now I'm here. And then after this is my family time. I'm not taking any more phone calls. I might respond to text messages. I'm just being very honest and vulnerable with everyone because I can't just talk about these things and stick to the Bible and not make it practical. This is how my practical life looks like. MC, you can remove that so we can move on. Does anybody have any questions before I move forward? Do I need to reshare? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I'll reshare my screen. All right, so watch for questions. If there are any questions, let me know. Um, we talked about physical boundaries. I gave you my story. Let me just go through some of my struggles beyond time. I had my no didn't always mean a no. My yes did not always mean a yes. I was not able to delegate. I couldn't delegate responsibilities with, with all the things that I do. I felt like I had to carry the whole load on my head. And Dr. McCorney. Yeah. I think there is a hand. Sorry, just yeah. to take you back. Oh, sure, sure. I see. I see a hand. Come yes. On. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, praise the Lord. Can you hear me? I see Pastor Adoni is with me. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mokwini. I just had a question. First of all, let me just commend you uh, for the powerful, powerful um, planning out there. And this is one of, for me personally, it's been one of my things this year to take control of my time and to plan ahead. But I face a challenge and I don't know, maybe you can help with some uh, pastors and others out there where there's some things that are not planned. I can't really plan that my Macron is uh, going to have a situation today that she's going to call me for. I can't really, and sometimes even when I know that, okay, you know what, I need to sleep, but then <laughs> my heart hears that, oh, sister so-and-so is calling me, um, marriage is in turmoil, she needs counseling. Uh, how do I say now my, you know, I'm not taking more calls. <laughs> All right, I heard you, Pastor, and I'm sure you're asking for many people. So unplanned circumstances, I'm gonna to touch on it a little bit, but I think I'm, I'm, I will address it again as we go. So give me a chance to move forward, but unplanned circumstances, if you notice in my time, only 17 hours is like planned out. But remember I said, we get this resource every day. I've gotten those kinds of phone calls. Matina in the hospital, Matina is in, yeah, this, could write this. So my planned out time is not 24 hours. There's room for God to move. There's room for God for me to be used of things. That's why the Bible says men in their hearts, they make plans. But at the end of the day, there's times I've woken up thinking I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, but I end up 
going to visit some lady who said they needed food. So that's reality. But what having a plan does is I, I fight for it. On the days that I'm successful, it's very successful. On the day that God took over, God took over. I'm okay with that. It's adjustable, it's not written in stone, but it's just a guide to guide my physical self because I am a physical person and I'm also a spiritual person. And I recognize that some things are beyond my control. So whatever I have planned, I have planned, but I have room, plenty of room for God to do what he wants with me. I am a vessel, use me. But the more I've been doing this and allowing this manna that I get 24 hours every day, sometimes I feel I tell my friends, they'll tell you my friends, my, my friends who are here, that sometimes girls, I feel like I have 30 hours in a day. God has a way of multiplying my time when I'm being a good steward with the 24 hours that he has given me. There's a concept I've, I didn't intend on talking about that, but I'm just going to bring it out to pop back in my head. Those who understand tithing, tithe your time. I'll repeat that. Those who understand tithing, tithe your time. Tithe your personal time with God. I'm not, this was not in my notes, but I'm not talking about the time you spend doing things for Pastor Makai's church, Pastor Adonis's church, Pastor Marvelous, the pastors that I know. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your personal time with God. How much time are you spending with God? Because sometimes we don't have boundaries on the things that we're doing for everybody. But God, I say it, sometimes we spend time doing things for everybody, but God. And as a result, there is no boundaries on how this manner that you get every single day. You don't know where it went. You look back at your day. Some people woke up at 12 o'clock today. This is your first reasonable activity you're doing. What did you do ever since you woke up? I think I'll move on. That's Adonis, so hopefully my question will be answered even more. Thank as you. Well. No, thank you, thank you. All right. Now, the other boundary that I've set, I'm moving a little slowly because I, I feel I need to do that. I have let the color of my skin dictate the things that I can do in this life until God freed me that I didn't put this skin to be a boundary. There's so much more inside of me that is beyond the skin. Those of you in the professional world, you know what I'm talking about, or not in, just living in, in a country that's not your own. If you are not careful, your skin can be a boundary. But there's a freedom that I have discovered that I'm not ashamed of my skin. I'm not ashamed of my accent. I am free because I'm a child of God. I spend time with God and he tells me how special I am. So you can look at me and see whatever you want, hear me talk and decide whatever you want. I am not bothered because I told you from the beginning, when I look at myself, I see a jewel in the palm of the hands of God. So know who you are for you to know how to do this boundary thing that we're talking about. Have you ever felt so over responsible to need to save someone? Like you feel like, oh, they need my help. They need to be saved. I need to do something and rescue them. Let me tell you something. As I was preparing for this ever since last year and trying to leave it, I realized in my life there's people I've rescued who did not need my rescue. And as a result, they are angry at me for rescuing them. Because I decided, oh, they need to be saved. They need to be rescued. I worked my backwards. I found multiple jobs and raised funds and did this and did this and put them in a new spot. They are not appreciative and I'm angry. Why am I angry? What was my motive for running around, begging my back, working in all sorts of places to give money to your open person who doesn't want to be helped? I did not put my boundaries right. Neither did I allow God to direct where and how I use the resource that he gives me every single day. I hope you are following me. I have rescued people. I have helped people. I've given advice to people who did not need it. And as a result, now they resent me. And I thought I was doing something good. That's boundaries. I crossed their boundary. I rescued a young girl who had gotten a 16 year old got pregnant in Zimbabwe. I thought, oh my goodness, form four. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, we did this, we did this. Oh, we think they're in a bed. But guess what? The rescue resulted in this young girl not having a relationship with their child. They lost maybe the love of their life. So now they don't like me anymore. Because of my desire to help, I help without boundaries. So helping with no boundaries does not help anybody. That's why I said, know who you are. 
tithe your time. Know what God is, go only where God is asking you to go. Sometimes you're working in our own flesh and we end up crossing people's boundaries and then we get mad. Wise boundaries allow people to be themselves. If you are really following boundaries, you allow people to be themselves. You don't feel obligated to answer people's demands immediately. I cannot demand, there's no demand that if I don't answer it, God cannot answer it. I've told myself that sometimes I want someone to be saved because I think I want them to know the Lord so badly and forgot that even if they're in Burundi and I'm in Chiredzi, I can pray for them and I believe in a God who answers prayers. I can pray for their deliverance from wherever I am. It is not my job to rescue the world. It's a boundary that you have to make a choice to make. It's okay sometimes to set a healthy distance between the people that we love so that we can love them better. Sometimes when you're too close, you, close, you cause friction and you can't love them and they can't love you, you're just too close. So knowing those differences in people allow us to grow and to flourish. I see Odia Young, your hand is up, please go ahead. I, um, I have a quick question regarding the boundary type. So I'm currently um, a pastor's wife and um, a lot of my friends attend my church. What boundary type should I set with my friends? Would that be the expectation boundary? Very good question. I'm going to answer it quickly and then hopefully as we go, you'll get your answer as well. Okay, I, feel, sure. I feel like every relationship requires an evaluation. Each relationship is different. You want to analyze each relationship and say, I'll tell you an example. I'm not a pastor. I just love to teach the word of God. But I have friends who are so dear to me. One friend had an important event going on. One friend I had set a date with. We're going out to do our nails and do this and do this. And then the husband of one friend called me and said, hey, I need you. I'm doing something. You need to be here now. And I decided in my head, this is a one-time event, so I'm going to cancel this one event and go to this one event. I disappointed one friend, but I made one friend happy. Was that an easy road to walk? No, but I had to go back and explain to this one individual why I made the decision that I made. Like, look, I'm sorry I disappointed you, but I had a one-off one, one event that was coming. It was no repeat, but you and I can reset this and we can redo it. It took some talking. It took some love and understanding to iron that difference. So it's okay sometimes to say no to the people that you love and not respond to everybody's need when they want you because you're not God. You're not their Holy Spirit. Amen, thank you. Let me move on. So on this slide, I'm talking about um, the types of boundaries that God has. God has boundaries on us. I asked earlier, is it biblical to, to set boundaries? And my answer is yes. If you look at God, the way he created everything, the moon, the stars, look at nature. It has boundaries. The sun never comes out at the wrong time. The rivers never flow over. Now, like the ocean stays where it's supposed. If it does, then accident, something's wrong. But everything knows when to germinate. You put a baby in somebody's womb, it knows when to grow. It stays there for nine months. It comes out. Animals do the same thing. God put boundaries everywhere. The final boundary is the finality of life. So if you are created by a creator who put his spirit in you and is a God of boundaries, why can't you have boundaries? Know who you are. My master has boundaries. My master created boundaries. So I have every right to put boundaries on certain things. As long as I leave room for the Holy Spirit of God to move within my life, I am a. Re I don't want to be a reservoir. I want to be a a, 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 a conduit for the things of God to move. Sometimes I have to let go of my boundaries so that I can help the next person, and that's okay too. And that takes the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit to know when to stop, when to start. So what am I saying? That tithing of your time is where you get your GPS on what to do with your twenty-four hours. In the Bible, there are people who put boundaries. I'm gonna give you two stories. I, look at, I looked for the very first time at Queen Vashti. You all know the story of Queen Vashti. I know she's preached for many, I just looked at it from the perspective of boundaries. I don't know what this woman was like. I didn't get to do that research. All I wanted to understand is why did this woman 
a pretty beautiful woman. Your husband is drunk, he's so excited. And he said, I want you to come out so I can parade you in front of this man. And she drew a line in the sand, she said, no. She lost the crown, she went to Esther. We don't hear about Vashti in the Bible, she's gone. So I was like, what, 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 what happened to this lady? I still have to research, but I really was looking at her like, what happened? What, she chose to lose a crown, to be a king's wife, all this glory, all this money, because she was going to preserve your dignity. I thought that was so powerful. Like, why don't we talk about her more? We talk about Esther, she's great. But this woman draw a line. She said, my integrity is more valuable than this crown. So I'm challenging some people here that you are more valuable than what the world's expectations on you are. We look at, I, I believe it was Joshua who said, after whatever conversation he was saying, he said, as for me and my family, he drew the line in the sand, we shall serve the Lord. Some people here have to draw certain lines like that. So boundaries are not only found in creation, they are found in people in the Bible themselves. Jesus himself withdrew from the crowds. You go by himself because he was putting a time boundary on people. He was putting a, time, a need for refilling. So why can't we do the same thing? When was the last time you went on a retreat just to go and be refilled? Or you're just constantly pouring, pouring, pouring until you start to speaking from your own physical nature and your own biases. There's no more Holy Spirit is there. It's just you talking. What is sins left you? Because the, you, you, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit anymore. You're not filled with the things of God anymore. When we surrender to God, he leads us to be the person that he created us to be. Some of us here, you know who you're supposed to be, but you're not living the life that God created you to be because your boundaries are all over the place. So I hope that as, as I'm talking, you feel that in your heart, God, I know who you created me to be. I know what kind of a leader you want me to be, what kind of a husband, what kind of a wife, but I'm not living that way right now. I'm not doing that. The kind of godly boundaries we're going into now are boundaries that help us to understand who we are. They help us to understand our identity. When you have such boundaries that people don't want to be around you, those are rules. I'm not talking about rules. The kind of godly boundaries I'm referring to that starts from the heart. Their intent is to draw others to us and point them to Jesus. So if my behaviors are so spiky and so full of rules and things are, oh, don't do this to me, I'm Chira, I'm Soko, I'm this, I'm this, I'm rules, full of rules. Nobody wants your God because your God is not attractive. And that we are here, go ye and spread the gospel. So if you have boundaries that are messed up, Nobody wants your God because you don't know how to manage your time. You're constantly running like a chicken without a head. You're always complaining. Nobody wants that kind of a God. He didn't create us. He created us to be fulfilled. He created us to be busy, yes. He created us to do things, to sleep, to rest, to love, to do all these good things. And it is possible. I've done it for six months before I came here today. I'm not speaking from a textbook. I am speaking of a lived experience. Don't I look rested? I've been sleeping. I was starting to develop a little thing here, a stress thing. You know how you're always like this? Because you're so stressed out. It was becoming permanent. I said, uh 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 uh, I'm sleeping. I told my husband, if you are joining me at 10 or you're not, adios. I'm sleeping. I need to rest. I need to take care of my body. I'm spending time in the shower. I'm scrubbing myself. I'm too valuable in the hands of God. I need to save him. If I'm tired and just cranked here, nobody will listen to anything that I'm saying. I need to rest. That's all I'm saying. Godly boundaries help us to build relationships, not to tear each other down. Godly relationships are not meant to punish one another. Oh, you did this to me, so if you are my wife, no, no, no game for you because you, you've been rude to me. That's a rule. That's not a boundary. Boundaries are not meant to, to punish each other. They are, they are meant to, for you and I to love one another, to bring each other into these close relationships so that those who are watching us may want what we have. Our godly boundaries are meant for you to check your motives. When you run to Western Union and you spend a thousand dollars and you are left behind with nothing to eat in your house, what was your motive for doing that? Was your motive to save face? 
was your motives with this? So, 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 so my niggas daughter is doing this so that I can be up here too. What was your motive for doing that? So godly boundaries are meant for us to check our motives because God judges the intents of the heart. When you are waking up, staying all night, running around with people's problems, what is your motive? When they don't say thank you and they don't give you a little bit of a gift, are you okay with it? If you're irritated that, oh, they don't even know I didn't sleep and now they can't even thank me, your motives are not straight. So as long as you're doing what you're doing and you're okay with it, whichever reaction you get from people, I checked myself. I told you about people that I rescued in Zimbabwe who don't talk to me to this day, but I thought I was doing a good thing. I checked my motive and I realized that our whole village we were trying to save face. We didn't want to be embarrassed. Mother was a leader in the church. Yeah, this, this, yeah, what, 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 yeah, yeah, protect the name, yeah, do, do all these decisions, trying to save face. That was the reason why certain decisions were made as a group, not by one person, with very wrong motives. So do you blame that individual? I don't, because the motives were not straight, the boundaries were not clear. All the same boundaries everywhere, from Genesis to Revelation. He has given us good and evil. God is evil. Without question, God has boundaries. So if the Holy Spirit of God is a deposit that is inside of you, why won't you want to have these godly boundaries? Why put rules on each other? Why stress each other and prevent yourself from growing and expanding? If you don't have godly boundaries, you can't even trust anyone to replicate the things that you do. I said I'm using myself as an example. I work with a lot of people. Just this morning, I was empowering a group of they decided to call themselves, they, they, they are foreign people who do what I do. So they were like, you know, we wanted, we saw you at this conference. We wanted to talk to you because we think you would understand, you know, you're also a foreigner. I'm from Philippines. I'm from this country. You know, when I go, I look different. And I say to them, listen, I'm talking about boundaries today. There are certain boundaries that people have put on you that you are allowing. People are putting quotes on you and you're switching quotes depending on what environment you are in. Be comfortable in your own skin. Nobody has a right to define you. Don't take a name that does not belong to you. If you are in a marriage and somebody keeps calling you stupid, you need to put your foot down because at some point you're gonna end up believing that you're stupid. So don't take names that don't belong to you. You are honey, you are sweetie. Yeah, take that. You are beautiful, you are pretty, you are handsome. Take that, don't take anything else. And I'm saying this from experience. My husband is listening and we talked about this. He knows I'm saying it. Don't take any names that don't belong to you because God created you like a special jewel. Do you get me? Why? <laughs> Healthy boundaries lovingly offer a choice to others rather than attempting to control them. Love does not demand its own way. Godly boundaries clearly communicate their expectations and the reasons behind them. Biblical boundaries clearly define the consequences of a violation of that boundary. So let me tell you how it looked like this afternoon. So the priest of my house is called Kumi, he's on the line. Before I present anything to a group of 71 people, I have to present to the priest so that the priest can give me comments, he takes my clothing, make sure I'm looking okay. So when I presented these things, we actually had a lived experience. I was eating my lunch, preparing for this. So he came, he showed up, I was 80% done. Don't go down, I was about 80% done. He showed up with this plate. He says, hey, you wanna go sit over there? And I said, no, I'm gonna finish my food here. I'll come and join you. So we ended up talking about it because what used to happen when I was younger, I would grudgingly pick up my plate and say, why should I leave my space? In my heart. Then I'll go and join him and life goes on as normal. He comes from work, I'm sitting somewhere else. Hey, come and join me, let's go watch TV over there. I mean, then, I, then I'm complaining in my heart. When it happens four or five times, you develop a certain level of resentfulness. But after being married for 25 years, I am able to say, honey, I was finishing up Chicago Med. Let me finish my show. Give me about 15 minutes, I'll be right there. I finish what I was doing in my space, I'm in control of my space. And then I go join my husband. Everybody's happy. Rather than me grudgingly leaving my Chicago maid, it's my show that I like. 
I turn it off. I go and sit with him. But in my heart, I'm like, I wonder what's happened to that person. My mind is not there. I'm talking about basic, simple things, but they grow. The enemy will come in and start saying, oh, why do you keep getting told what to do? You're being controlled. You're a human being. So know your soft boundaries. They are not written anywhere. They are in here. We're talking about matters of the heart. I hope by now you've gotten that. Pastor, Makai, is it clear that we're talking about matters of the heart? Amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor. Text to somebody, please text to somebody who is not online, your brother, your sister, say, hey, you're missing out. Thank you. All right, we are moving on to a second set of questions. Uh, I know there are people on the phone, so please put this in the chat. I need to hear from you guys. What is crossing a boundary? Now that we've talked a little bit, I've been vulnerable, I shared my own story. What are some examples of boundaries that we do in life? Have you crossed them before? And what was the reaction? Now that we've kind of talked about this, let's hear from a few people. I'll give it about a minute or so. Or if you wanna open mic, we can do open mic for a couple of people. What is crossing a boundary? Auntie Piola, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Doc. Um, so I think that the biggest one for me is when it comes to just knowing the boundaries with our co-workers. I mean, you know, sometimes, yes, they are friends, but we just have to know when, when to cross the line and when not to cross the line and having boundaries. And so sometimes also it's also challenging when your supervisor is like a friend. Uh, I still think those boundaries can, can kind of be it can be an issue where you might not know where the line, where to draw the line. And it's important for us also to kind of know when to draw the right line. Yes, they are friends, they are our friends, but they're also our supervisors. And so there's a certain boundary that we also need to keep. And I think that's one area that I have found myself also struggling with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you very much. We'll take two thank more you. people, open mic. Or oh, MCs, if you see something in the chat, just read it as well. What is crossing a boundary? What are some of the examples that we deal with? Have you ever crossed anyone's boundaries? And what was the reaction? Uh, Tuli, go ahead. Yeah. Oh. Uh, thank you, Mama Cody. I have I've actually crossed a boundary with um, my younger sister before. We had this uh, thing back home where. Um, if something, if, if a name is a nickname, people used to say you don't have control over it. You just have to accept it. And so I did realize that my, my younger sister was actually not happy about being called by that name. And um, the response to crossing that boundary was her being sad and not really being, ex being happy every time we call her with that name. So that's something that I had to really look into and realize and realize that it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not good or it's not correct to call people by names that they don't prefer. Absolutely. Thank you very much. My name is Shirai. Oh, hi, daughter. Thank you so much. This is so powerful. And I'm so grateful that I saw this on Facebook uh, to join this. So for me, it's just no not knowing who I am, what's my value. So I'll go for a job. I'll just take it as an African Zimbabwean. I'll just say yes. But then come to realize I have so much. Like you say, I'm an egg in God's hands. So I have to realize that I have value. Who I am, despite of my accent, despite of my height, I have to come up no one can be a Shurai in this world. And there's something unique that I have that nobody have, that God, once I came to realize that I have a purpose that nobody have, it's inside, it's born inside of me. That's when I realized that I can't even cross even another person uh, as well. I have to respect every person that comes to me. I have to see them that they're an egg so when I look at people, I had to take like a 30 day to practice how to honor every human being that was created by God and respect them and love them. That's when like a light bulb just came up and God just started using me and blessing me. 
Amen. In everything that I was doing. Amen. Amen. I mean, I like what you just said. Give me a minute, Michelle and the Auntie Kudzi. Uh, for me personally, when I begin to acknowledge other people's boundaries within my home, with my family, that is when God began to open doors for me to do so much because I could relate with anyone, anytime, at any given time, as long as they are willing, I'm there to relate with them. But when you have all these boundaries that are on you, I would rather you people put boundaries on me, but I won't mm. them because they are not mine. So as, if you are free from boundaries, when you look at a person, you're looking at a child of God, like what my, okay. mind, my real mining, by the way. And when you're looking at what she said that you start to respect everyone, you have rich relationships. Sometimes that people don't even know that you relate with people at such a deep level because you don't have all these cages around you of self-respect and this mm -hmm. messiah, messiah atmosphere about you. You're not a savior. You're just mm -hmm. a human being who's loved by God, who is here because of grace. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll go to Auntie Kuzi, then Michelle. Hi, everyone. I hope this won't make me very unpopular, but one thing I see, especially in our African community, the pressure of asking people when they are getting married. When are you getting married? Or mm -hmm. if you are married, when are you having a baby? Mm -hmm. Those boundaries, the pressure that you put on people, what if they don't want to get married? Or what if they are not ready to have a baby yet? It's not your question to ask. If they need anything, they will come and tell you. It's like going to an old person and say, when are you dying? You cannot do that. So that's the same thing. Don't do it to other women or men or anything. Absolutely. Thank you. That's a very, very valid point, which a lot of people will kind of dance around. You see a young girl, maybe they're not finding the perfect person. Who are you to ask them? Don't ask me if you're not bringing somebody forth. I agree with that. Absolutely. I don't think if a, if a young couple is married, we struggle to have a child. There came a time I didn't want to call Zimbabwe because every phone call, when are you having a child? I finally said to my husband, you know what? I'll call them when I have a baby. So I stopped. Because that's what they talk to me about. When are you having a child? Why is that so important? I can't. It's not happening. What do you want me to do? So crossing those boundaries, very, very important. Those are expectation boundaries, emotional. But you're crossing a lot of boundaries when you ask somebody who's gained weight if they are pregnant. You've crossed so many boundaries, like at every level. So what this means, what this conversation is going to is it's important to have self-awareness. Be aware of your space, where you are in space, and just respect everyone the way you want to be respected, because that is biblical. Michelle, and then we'll continue. Um, thank you, Dr. Makoni. I don't know, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for this teaching. Um, this is so powerful. Uh, and I like Auntie Kuzi's example, you know, about people being invasive with their questions. I think we really um, do cross boundaries a lot. Um, I think we do this every day. Sometimes we're unaware, which reminds me, of, you know, my mom when she talks about um, being emotionally, um, emotionally intelligent. Uh, so, you know, that kind of crosses, you know, uh, what she's talking about right now, which is what she always says. And um, I don't mean to shamelessly plug here, but uh, yesterday, well, not yesterday, but today, I was actually doing a podcast on boundaries so funny enough you know um and it, you know I was talking about how like sometimes you're in a relationship and then you want to make um you know your partner's friends your friends forgetting that, that there are boundaries you know like just leaving room for boundaries that okay yes we're together and yes we can be you know even with your husband I'm sure you have family friends but also just knowing that yes we are family friends but these were my husband's friends and just leaving that room like you know um, that space of saying, okay, these are my husband's friends. Yes, we are friends, but you know, they are also his, I met them through him. And um, when you were asking about like the word of God, does the word of God, um, you know, talk about boundaries and stuff like that? I think a verse that came to me, I believe it's in John, I don't remember the exact verse, but um, it talks, well, you know, it says that no one can come to, to, to God except through me. So even God has boundaries. He has that boundary that if you want to come to me, you have to go through my son first. Thank absolutely. You. absolutely. Thank you so much for all the contributions, everyone. When pastor said kingdom conversation, this is what came to my mind. It must be a dialogue where I'm not just talking at you. We are all conversing together and answering each other's questions as we go. I saw a couple of things in my, in the chat. Someone said forcing yourself in someone's space and not respecting it, that's probably crossing a boundary. You are correct that I, 
And I think Matilda said navigating relationship with friends and their significant others. Yes, that takes what Michelle just called emotional intelligence. From my perspective, I've gone to school quite a bit. There is no school that I went that taught me emotional intelligence. I believe that comes from God. I believe that is a godly skill. I believe that comes when you're spending time with God. That's how you get emotional intelligence. That's no, just that's not true at all. So my parents did their best to taught me to teach me intel intel to be emotionally intelligent by rebuking me and saying, "Don't say that. Don't do that." But that doesn't make him emotionally intelligent. You see, this is where people give. Oh. All right, we can hear you. <laughs> so emotional emotional intelligence is 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 a land you you have to want it. You have to desire it. You have to pray for it. You have to say, you know what? I want to be intelligent around people. I don't want to just say dumb things. I don't want to offend other people. I don't want to step on people's toes. I don't want to make anybody angry because of what came out of my mouth. God help me. For me, that's what works. And then somebody said, how is your husband and your children? You don't even know my background. That's what we were talking about earlier. Uh, and I'll read the other stuff later. Let me continue here. Thanks everyone for your for your uh, contribution. So as we start to learn this ship, how then do we set boundaries? A lot of new things came up. You know, is the expectations, respecting boundaries, calling people names when you give a nickname to somebody that they don't like it. You 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 hurt somebody, and we're not supposed to be hurting each other. We don't want relationships that hurt people. So I put that in bold letters. Boundaries that we've talked about for the last, I don't know, 45 minutes, it's not setting laws and regulations. Let me address each category. Men, boundaries is not putting laws and regulations over your, your wife. Wives, boundaries is not setting laws and regulations over your husband. And this goes on through every relationship. I want to really go through this very, very carefully. Boundaries is honesty, is the sense, it's sincere, it's the integrity that is based out of love and respect. So when I'm telling my spouse that I feel like you crossed my boundary, I am not yelling at that point. When I feel like my daughter said something that I didn't like, I hope that my children who are here will say, mommy is right. I've been working in progress to say to myself, if someone says something to me, I find a loving and respectful way of communicating that what you said made me feel disrespected. And this is how it made me feel dis disrespected and explain the, the why behind my reaction instead of just acting out of whatever the little that I heard. It's about giving each other place. It's utter respect. That is again rooted in love. Who is love? Who is love? I can hear mouth going. You all know what I'm talking about. We know who love is. So when we are putting boundaries on each other, the kinds of boundaries we're talking about today, they are rooted in love, in who, him, who is love, the standard of love. It's being honest to yourself. You have sometimes to sit down and say, you know what, I messed up. What I say to that girl was very wrong. What I say to that man at work was wrong. I messed up. And you have to be okay with that. And then you take it to the next level. In your time with God, there's a time where you have to say, God, I'm so sorry. I felt so jealous. That was such a bad thing. Be, be vulnerable before God. I, I, I said this very good thing, but my motive wasn't right. I said, oh, you look great, but I didn't mean it. Boundaries are about being honest. I, I, get, I get emotional when I start talking about being, being vulnerable with self and with God, because that's the authenticity that is missing within the church. There's a lot of, people, you know, wearing Halloween masks and faking around. For the church to grow, for the people of God to really talk about this boundary, healthy relationships, each individual, it doesn't matter who you are. We have to get to a place where you're honest with self and you're honest with God so that you can be honest with those that are around you. It's taking responsibility for your own actions and being accountable. It's being bold 
when you've overlooked other people's boundaries to say, you know what? I think I crossed your boundary before they even tell you. Let them say, no, you didn't. But be okay to say, Michelle, I think what I said was a bit too much. I crossed your boundary. I'm sorry if I did. You have no idea, Michelle will come back. I'm just using Michelle as an example. She will come back to you more and more and more because she knows that you're a person of integrity. You're not going to jump on a high horse and say, I'm the older one here. You have no right to tell me that I was wrong. Parents, we're not perfect people. When you mess up and your young adult tells you, mom, I don't like the way you spoke to me. Forgive them if they come out wrong, but take responsibility for your own actions. We're not perfect people. We are just human beings that are saved by grace. I'll keep going. I'm going to ask, um, oh, let me just finish this up. So when, what do we do when boundaries are crossed? I already talked about it. Accept responsibility, take a compromising, cooperative, negotiative, supportive reaction and support each other. I'm talking in any relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, dating, friendships, take responsibility for your own actions. Trust each other because that's what the church does. Do not always be right. Do you know there are some people who can never be wrong? They don't think their stuff in the bathroom stinks, but everybody else's smells but themselves. They are so messiah-like, they do no wrong. Those people are very difficult to relate to. They're very difficult to live with. And I'm proud to say, I'm not, I don't live in a house with people like that. My children are not like that, at least to one another. My husband is not like that. It's something that we strive for as a family that nobody's perfect. Even I mess up sometimes and I'm okay to go to my 14 year old and say, you know what, dude, I was rude, I'm sorry. It's okay, mom, <laughs> nobody's perfect. You have to accept to say I'm wrong. Take responsibility because then you build stronger relationships. In any conflict, there's a shared responsibility. In English, they say it takes two to what? To get tangled up. When there's an argument, people with healthy boundaries, you are not always pointing because these three are pointing back at you. Always remember when you say, you, you did this, you did this. There's all these ones that are saying, uh, 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 you are responsible too. So always sit back and say, okay, what happened? What did I contribute? And take responsibility. Both the offender and the offended, there's a fair share of air responsibility. Someone maybe didn't listen, someone misunderstood, someone misspoke, something happened within those boundary situations. So both the offender and the offended in a healthy relationship, you sit back and you analyze the situation and you take what's yours. Pride is our biggest problem. Now, I'm going to go and start talking about my suggestions from a lived experience. There's a difference between being assertive and being aggressive. The more I've been talking, giving opportunities, I go back and I look at videos after I've talked and I analyze myself. There was one video that I said, lady, you came off very aggressive because I was, I, was, I was pumped up about this topic in a negative way, actually. It was a racial thing and I was very pumped up and I did come off a bit aggressive. So I had to take a step back and say, I need to control what's going on inside so that the way I present myself is assertive, but not aggressive. Sometimes as black women, especially, we are misunderstood for being aggressive because we're just trying to be heard. Women, I'm talking to you. When you are putting your boundaries in place, be assertive, but don't be aggressive. There is a difference. Men don't respond to aggression. Women don't respond. Nobody responds to aggression. But assertiveness is different. In fact, my husband says it's attractive when a woman is assertive, but it's, so, it's not attractive when they are aggressive. Eh, I want to be attractive. So I would rather be assertive than aggressive. I said this earlier because I wanted to repeat it respond, don't react. I already explained the difference there. It's okay to be guarded with my time. Like I already explained everything earlier. Time is a huge commodity for me. And when people do not respect my time, I would feel offended and not say anything. But now I'm comfortable to say, you know what, auntie, I'll get back to you. And Pastor Makai will tell you, <laughs> first I'll get back to you on Friday. Let's make an appointment at three o'clock. And at the three o'clock, I'm going to be there until she tells me to leave. 
because that's the time I created for her. That's just what I do with my friends. That's how I've built strong relationships because then when I'm present, I'm fully present. But if I'm talking to you with the half ear, I'm trying to cook, I'm trying to, I can't build the relationship with you. Do not allow people's emotions and choices to set boundaries on you. Sometimes when people show up and they're angry, they were angry before you got there. Don't take responsibility. If my mother would say, I'm not carrying your monkey. Your emergence is not my inconvenience. So if you are mad and you're coming from wherever you're coming from, that's not my problem. Please take care of your own horses and I'm willing to get into your space and we can negotiate, but don't allow everybody this emergency to become your emergence. Sometimes you have to sit back and say, okay, they are in a hurry, but is it necessary to be in that kind of a hurry? Do not answer to names you are not known for. I will repeat that. Don't allow other people to make choices for you. Learn to say no. My mismanaged soft boundaries will prevent me from growing in my purpose for God. So to my friends who have never given a straight answer, Maud, how do you do this? I saw you're campaigning for this at your job. You're doing this. You're a manager. There you're doing this. How do you do all that? I manage my soft boundaries and I want to grow in my purpose for Christ. So I manage my resource called time well. And I don't allow people to do whatever they want with my time. But I'm available when I'm needed and I still allow God to move within my life. I need boundaries when it comes to trusting people. This is my work in progress. I think sometimes I just trust everyone and I bring them everyone. I'm talking now to my leaders who are in ministry. Set limits on the people that you bring close in your inner circle because not everybody has good intentions. I just thought I'd throw that out there. This is for my people who are above me. Well, sometimes you just drag us in and we, some of us come where Jonas will make your boat start to rock. So don't bring Jonas in your boat. We need boundaries as far as that is concerned as well. Now I'm gonna ask, these ones are difficult to read. So I asked my uh, MCs to read the four slides. Please listen carefully as they are reading. So let's read the one that says, before I put myself down, I will ask myself because putting yourself down is the first boundary. You must know who you are. So whoever has that one, please read it. Loud and slowly so everyone can hear. All right, so the first slide says, um, would, I uh, would I take to my friends, family, clients, students this way? If nobody was watching or judging me, what decision would I make? What do I know about myself that doesn't align with these particular thoughts? Is there anything else that I may need or additional support? What have I done this year that outweighs what I haven't done? How could I give myself what I'm hoping this, how could I give myself what I'm hoping this other person will give me? What evidence do I have to support this? Is this a fact or this a feeling? Is this thought process beneficial? What does this mood mean to me? How can I be more compassionate to myself? How can I communicate these feelings to someone, maybe a friend, a family member, or mental health professional? Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. I love the way you did it. So if you were listening, these are things or just nuggets I'm trying to throw at you. The first boundary begins in the heart with you putting yourself down. So these are just suggestions of a thought process. It's an intentional process of asking yourself, why are you putting yourself down? Why do you think you are inadequate? Why do you think you should take a name that's not yours? Why do you think it is the extent of boundaries? Why? Ask, ask yourself. Let's do the next one. Meeting yourself where you are. So meeting yourself where you are, giving yourself adequate time to feel every emotion. Mm -hmm. Not setting a timeline for your healing. It's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. Practicing mindfulness, being present in the moment. Mm -hmm. Not apologizing to reassure others. Mm -hmm. Taking a moment to celebrate recent areas of growth and accomplishments. Mm -hmm. Not pressuring yourself to forgive in order to move on. Listening to your body cues. Not apologizing to reassure others. Honoring your skills and talents without depleting. Mm -hmm. 
and not forcing not forcing yourself to just get over it exactly a lot of people just do things just to get over it a lot of people apologize just to move on and then you walk away with all this brokenness inside of you and you can't grow in your purpose and you wonder what is happening because the burden that you carry inside of you is the kind of energy that you give out as you walk around we have two more to go through mcs let's do the how to stop being hard on yourself Okay. Um, your mistakes are part of your learning. Learn to be resilient in the face of failure. Do not criticize yourself for, the, for those mistakes. Expand your definition of success. You don't need to lower your bar, but you do not need to broaden your scope of what qualifies as a win. Mm -hmm. Be present. Stop focusing on what you have not accomplished yet. Being present in the moment or being mindful is an important skill to have. Surround yourself with people who want you to succeed. Having, having people you can trust and rely on will make you happier and feel better about yourself. Stop discounting your own ideas. Recognize the value in your ideas and share them with the world. Don't compare yourself to others because you aren't them, period. You, you are you, the best person to be. So accept yourself for who you are, your faults and all. Thank you so much, Mr. and Mrs. Manjengwa. Our last one says, you use up everything you have trying to give everybody what they want. And as a result, you are empty, you run on E, you don't have time for God, but you think you're doing God's work. The last thing I wanna talk about today is something I learned in a mental health class very recently. These are called the I statements and we've been using them in our home and they work very well. If my husband was here, we'd have done it together, but he's not, so I'm gonna do it myself. So the I statement means, uh, let's say he's done something and I feel somehow about it. Instead of showing up with the finger like, you know what? Every time this is what you do, you are my you are you child, this is what you daughter, you son, with my finger going. When I focus on me and how I felt about the situation, it has resulted in better and healthier relationships because I'm talking about what boundaries of mine is been broken. So you know what? When you left work at, I'm giving live examples. You left work this morning at 6, you got on a train. I never heard from you until seven o'clock at night. I felt ignored. Instead of saying, why didn't you call me the whole day? You didn't even have lunch. It's because I used to do that. Then the response is, I am so sorry. I was in meetings after meetings after meetings all day. I did not get even a moment until I sat on the train. I had waking lunch. Much better conversation. But my old self would be waiting at the door. You take the baby. I've been with the baby all day. I'm tired. You don't even pick up the phone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Came done zero. My child walks in, she's maybe dressed a certain way that I don't appreciate. Instead of saying, I don't like the way you're dressed. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, when you dress like that, I don't feel proud of you. I don't feel okay because it just doesn't make me feel proud as a mother. Very different conversation. Because I know my children don't want me to feel embarrassed. I know that. So they're gonna work on that boundary instead of me pointing fingers and throwing stones. I hope that makes sense. Mr. and Mrs. Manjim, I can see your faces. Does that make sense? Okay. So I call those my I statements. My husband uses them, my children use them. We've been practicing them. We are working in progress and it's been working very well. The last part of this, how do you rate yourself now that we've talked and talked and talked? Are you easily persuaded by others? You don't have to answer that question. That's for you to take home. The first time I heard about boundaries during COVID, this is the question that made me wake up. Are you easily persuaded by others? Do you have a difficulty in saying no? Does your no always mean your no? Or sometimes you have to be asked a hundred times, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Are you okay? Yes, when your face is very angry. Do you say yes for the sake of pleasing other people? Are you unsure of your personal boundaries? 
Do you accept things you don't want in the different relationships that you are in? Does the other person always have an upper hand? Have this been said over to you? Why do you allow someone to talk to you like that? If somebody has ever said that to you, don't take it negatively. They have noticed that you don't have boundaries and you need to sit down and check yourself. So for me, when these questions were asked to me, I made it a point that I was going to sit down and answer them one by one. And I found myself wanting and I made an assignment out of it. I want to be that person who is not asked, why do you allow someone to talk to you like that? I don't want to be accepting things I don't want in the different relationships that I'm in. Assignment for everyone besides those questions. What types of healthy boundaries do you need to establish in your relationship, whether you're dating, you're not dating, in friendships, in a married life, as a pastor, as a child of God, a follower, whoever, a subordinate, a boss, what types of healthy boundaries do you need to establish? And then the second one is, how are you going to go about setting those boundaries? I don't have an answer for that. I just poured my life and I hope that you'll be able to sit down and answer some of these questions for yourself. How are you going to go about? Because if you really wanna serve God, if you really want your territory to expand and you begin to do mighty things for God, these are very important questions to answer for yourself and not for everybody else. Thank you. Wow, wow. Oh, guys, let's just, just clap and just be thankful. Dr. McConey, thank you. Oh my God. If someone can unmute and just, you know, thank God for this teaching, just clap your hands. Just be thankful. Thank you, my McConey. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Powerful. Yes, powerful. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. You left no stone unturned. Amen. You touched on children. You touched on our teenagers. You touched on our um, young adults. You touched on mothers, parents. You also touched on pastors. When you were talking, I was asking myself questions. So how do I draw boundaries with my own church members? Will they not say pastor doesn't love? Pastor doesn't care now. Will they allow me to, you know, it's, you know, you were talking and we were working and you were working on us and the word was working on us. So I'm just so grateful. I think I'm not the only one here. I think everyone who logged in, you don't regret why you logged in this afternoon. I don't want to waste so much time. There are people with questions. I want to respect people. Let's um, allow ourselves, raise your hand. Uh, if you want to unmute, unmute and then talk so that we, we, we are on time uh, before we go next uh, to the next thing. So if there are people who want to talk, I don't know the MCs, if you see them, uh, you can actually shout out to me and say someone wants to ask a question. Uh, but uh, if there is no one, I want to get back to Dr. McConey. Can you just uh, talk about, I think I have pastors who are here on this line. Where do we draw the line as pastors? Because this is not easy. Um, I know I'm not supposed to call someone when they don't show up for church, but at the same time, it's my responsibility. But at the same time, it's their right not to come. But at the same time, I have to do it for the sake of the kingdom. How, how, where do I draw the line when someone doesn't come to church maybe twice? Do I keep texting or I just leave it? Do I still have to do, I mean, where do we draw the line as pastors so that our church members still feel loved and still respected and still know that we are respecting their boundaries yeah. i got this i'm not asking for myself i have three pastors who are asking the question I'm I, to, pastors too. I am going to speak as a as that person who did not go to church and you're trying to figure out what, what's going on and um i will speak first of all for my zimbabwe community 
within my community, I have my mothers and my grandmothers. I might not talk to them. They're just people who just consider me their daughter. If they don't hear me on the line, I'll get a phone call or a text message. Are you okay? You're too quiet. And sometimes just that is enough to wake me up like, ah, I've not been joining the prayer line. Sure, it's been two weeks. Let me go back. So how they draw their line, I don't know. And then our pastor at our church, because we go to this church and during COVID, we all retreated. We were hiding in the homes, doing online church and everything. When church started, all he said one day, I'm just speaking from my own lived experience, what made me want to get up and say, hey, hey, what am I doing? He said, some of you go to Costco and we see you with your carts shopping. But when it, times to, when it comes time to come to church, you don't want to come to church because you're scared of COVID. <laughs> I heard him on, the, on, the, you know, on Facebook and I was like, oh, Joshua Knight. I was in Costco, I went shopping. But when it comes to go to church, I'm sitting on my couch because I'm scared of COVID. My point for saying that is as a child of God who's done what you're saying, I responded to that one meaningful conversation because you're assuming that I'm not dumb. I heard you. I know you've noticed that I'm not there. So it is now my responsibility. The moment someone comes the second and the third time, I'm beginning to say, ah, what do they want? Do they want something from me? <laughs> I'm speaking on, I hope I'm speaking on behalf of other people. And then sometimes I'm going through stuff and I'm not ready to see it. So I would say as a leader myself, who has had to reach out to other people, sometimes because I know people, I can tell that this silence is just not a silence, something is wrong. I don't know how to explain that, but there are some people I've reached out fully knowing that I reached out, I didn't hear back. I reached out, I didn't hear back. Something is wrong. So you sort of know your people. So I feel like it goes back to those building healthy relationships to where you know your people so well that when so-and-so is backing off, maybe they need space and that's okay. And feel, I would say, opening up the conversation to say to people, hey, if I don't see you, to get their permission, is it okay for me to reach out? And people will tell you exactly what they want. They will tell you, we had a survey in our church and I think people said, oh, I'm sure that's how this pastor figured it out. But I'm just saying that asking your people to draw where to draw the line, get their permission to, in, within their spaces. Because the moment they feel like, ah, pastor is constantly knocking on my door. Ah, maybe she's missing. We start thinking about all sorts of things. We bench benchers. We start thinking money. We start thinking all sorts of things. Now we are hiding from your phone calls because our minds are already going. So I think asking for that permission helps. That would be my position, both as a leader and also as a person who's needed people to, to look out for me. Thank you, Dr. Marconi. As you were talking, another pastor just texted me. She said, but what you are saying will work for young people. If we ask for permission from the youth or young people, it will work. But for adults uh, who are from Africa, if mm -hmm. I do that, uh, that shows that I don't care as a pastor, because in Africa, pastors, we didn't get invites to visit. We just showed up to check on our church members. And one of, if one um, of the church members is in hospital and she didn't have the uh, opportunity to send me a message or to text me, and I ignore them, it's going to be another issue again. So as pastors, we are between a hard, a, a hard rock and the water, you know, whatever you call it. Well, how do we handle that and still be, because when somebody really backslides and you didn't do a follow-up, you didn't uh, check, I mean, even in your heart as a pastor, I think mm -hmm. you feel like, God, I didn't do enough. It's okay to text first, and be ignored, text second time, be ignored, at least my hands are clean, then I can back off. Exactly. What do you think? Exactly. I will give my opinion and I'm hoping that other children like myself, whom you are referring to this, will also step up and, and, and truthfully speak. I think that that's where, where those, um, we have complex cultural boundaries as well, which I didn't even go into. Complex cultural boundaries are those hierarchical things, even though, for instance, Pastor Adonis might be a young, young pastor, but maybe she's leading all these older people. The expectations put on her 
are different by somebody who's, a, who's got in a more senior pastor that they look up to, even though they are older themselves. So I feel like navigating those complex cultural relationships, I'm not a pastor, but I can only say, I imagine that you guys, you, 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 what's charged of you is bigger. Searching that wisdom of knowing to do what the Bible says, be wise as a serpent and be peaceful as a dove. So navigating those rough roads, that's probably something that other pastors could speak out for. But as a child of God, I've responded to a card. You know, I received a card after I lost my mom, I disappeared from the church. And the choir, I can't remember if it was a choir there, someone, they all sent a card and say, hey, you know, it was a small group, Bible study, we miss you, we miss your loud opinions, we haven't seen you, blah, 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 blah. And I just felt loved. Another group just sent flowers to my door. And for me, that made me want to go back. Like, oh, maybe I need to go back to my friends. I had just put myself in a corner because I was grieving and I didn't know what to do with myself. But that extension of doing something so different made me feel more connected. So I think different people respond to different ways of being loved. That goes back to the five love languages. If some of you have read it, everyone responds differently to love. If you send flowers to somebody, they may be like, eh, why do I need that? But if you bring them a meal, or right now we're in the day of Uber Eats, just order a meal, get it delivered to their door. Hey, hey, some food from pastor's house and see what happens. So I think navigating that is just, um, it's, it's, it's developing again, those boundaries, the love languages, how do your flock wants to be loved? So I think it's homework on you, on you as leaders to learn your people, what kind of food does this fish want? You can't, you can't go and fish with the wrong bait because they're not gonna eat it. You know, you send them a message that's not the one they want you at their doorstep. So knowing what kind of fish you are fishing for, very important. That would be my opinion, but I hope other people are going to step Amen. up. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Dr. Makoni, for a very powerful session. But there's something Dr. Um, Pastor Makai said that resonates with me as a congregant. Pastor Makai, you asked uh, about the number of times to follow a parishioner. For I'll, I'll use myself as an example. There was a time when I was in a season uh, where I was flying solo, but I also have certain ministries that I participate in. So for instance, you as a pastor, and if you call me, what is going on with you? I will take the due diligence to explain to you I'm in a season Right now, I don't have anything else to give you, Pastor. Or oh, I don't have anything else to give. But when I'm when, when the time is ripe, I will I will come back. There are two things that for me, for my personality, what if you do that, you're actually pushing me away, is don't start preaching to me at that particular instance. I don't need a sermon. One. And secondly, the other thing is. If you ask me, when can I check back with you? And then I tell you, ah, maybe in a month or so. And then if, I, if, if, if we have that conversation and oh, in a month or so, if you remember to check with me, or if I remember I made a commitment to communicate with Pastor Makai, I'll give you an update. I'm still in that position. Oh, I'll, 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 something has developed. I'm coming back, but I'm coming back once every two weeks or once a month, that is what I have to give. The point I'm trying to make is, like Dr. Makoni was teaching, if we learn to unlearn, okay, I'm talking to you with a direction that I'm pushing you towards. And then we have a dialogue going back and forth, which is very difficult because there are cultural difficulties. You'll find it, it is easier even on you as pastors if you put it on the person to make a decision on when they, they, they will have the next conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maija Gajira. That's actually a boundary you're explaining. I think someone said we get angry if a pastor doesn't look for me. That means their, their soft boundary of feeling loved has been crossed. So I feel like as churches, it's important that pastors understand where we are coming from. How do we want to be loved? I'm from Zimbabwe, I'm from Nigeria, I'm from Kenya. Maybe the way we were loved in our different cultures is very different. So maybe it's a topic that needs to be discussed so that one-on-one, -on -one, once a year, get together with your different families within your congregation, find out how, how, what does it mean to be loved by a pastor? 
how, how, how do you respond to love from your leaders? How did it happen in your home? Sometimes it's because of how people were raised. If it was the mother who showed love in a moment of desperation, if the pastor guy shows up, they might not receive that love. But if pastor wife showed up, it represents mother. It represents what they know. So what we are comfortable with is different. In my home, my father would go quiet when things go bad. Doesn't mean that he wasn't there, but my mother would rise up. So sometimes when women rise up to come around me, I tend to respond that better. Unlike when I see men trying to encourage me because it's unfamiliar. It's, it just doesn't feel right. But I have friends who are very close to their fathers and when they see men rise up around them, it represents that daddy. My daddy came around and, and it, it's different. So I think that it is important as a community, this is community development as leaders to know your people, know who's around you. In fact, it's actually one way for myself, for the people that I work with, to really understand them. You know, what, when, they, when they go quiet, they run up they run up your loud, say, hey, what's up? Ah, you know, I'm not sleeping, man, this, this, and I can't be in Zimbabwe. Then you find out, okay, we are Kanyara. When they are quiet, it just simply means that they are really busy. They just don't go quiet on me. So I feel like it's a, it's a challenge and it's a gap that we as a people have to, to take care of and understand who's around you, who's in your friend group. How do they feel loved and what do they want? What do they expect? Maybe it's husband and wife. Wife wants pastor to show up, but husband might be a little offended if you showed up. So it's important to understand those, 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 it's homework, it's tough. It's not, I don't think this is an easy conversation. This is a hard conversation. Dr. McQuen, I would wish some pastors you would talk. I, I think it's a very difficult, you're gonna come in, right? Let me speak a little bit, then you can come in. I think it's a very difficult situation for pastors as much as we want to um, exercise that, but our hands are really tied in so many fronts. Yes, we are, our hands are tied because we are not only answerable to what people want, we are ambassadors, we are representatives. We don't represent what we want, we represent what the father wants. So. To, for us to go out and fulfill what everyone wants in the church one by one and do that maybe according to, you know, people now in America, things are changing. I think it's a bit difficult, but personally, I would say I would appreciate a believer who communicates with me so that I get to know you, so that I don't have to do what you don't want at least respect me as your pastor and say, pastor, when you don't see me, I'm working weekends, don't worry about it. You know, you know, sometimes my two weekends, I'm, at least I know you are okay. I don't have to panic, how about if she's sick? How about if something is going on? How about if, you know, because as pastors, sometimes we worry, sometimes we offended you and we wanna make things right too. So if I just ignore you, I think it's a bit, let me leave to Pastor Doris. <laughs> Amen. Thank you so much. You have said um, some of what I was going to say, um, that I'm going to speak more for, for the pastors. Amen. That um, there's not only, I think there's a boundary of expectation. So the boundary of expectation, we have God has expectation of us on the assignment he has given us. And then the flock have expectations and to the best of our ability, we can meet them. But now for the pastors, it's also uh, important for, for you to be able to take care of you as a pastor. Because if you look at the statistics, there are many pastors that are committing suicide. Why? Because this ends up being so much to where everybody pastor doesn't love me, pastor doesn't call me. But when did you ever call pastor and say, pastor, how can I pray for you? You can pray, you're not a pastor, but you can pray for pastor. Or just how can, when have you checked with pastor to see, because we pastors, you can see me, I'm a human being, you pinch me in church the same way it hurts you. But um, somehow there's this expectation that the pastor is supposed to do this much, do this much, do this much. And then now the pastors, now you're trying, at the same time you end up putting yourself in a bind. Now you're trying, okay, and Sister um, uh, Gladys wants to be, if she goes to disappear for two months, I must contact her one time. Sister Piola wants me to contact her every day. And and all that, um, all that can it can be a lot because other challenges that people shifting boundaries, amen. Today 
you want me to call you every day. Three months down the line, you shift your boundaries from you don't want to be called every day, you want to be called once a month. You don't communicate that to me. So what am I doing? Calling you every day. But your boundaries have shifted. Your boundaries have shifted maybe because of situations that have happened in your life or whatever it is that, that have caused you to shift boundaries. So I think it's important uh, to communicate and also for the pastors, don't don't spend yourself. For me, I have to literally learn to, to free myself. Amen. I love people, I love the work of God, but to free myself from the expectation that ends up the work of God being a burden for where I can can live and be frustrated. Oh, they're gonna be mad about this. Oh, I didn't show up at the funeral. Oh, I didn't show up at this. I'm a human being. But at the same time, I will try by all means to love you all with your love languages. But pleasing the Father. And it's important as pastors also value your mental health. It is self care that you are important. Uh, that's why at the end of the day, you find you, pastors, community, but they know the word. What happened that you never know why? Because now it's all of this frustration uh, where they have all these boundaries of expectations that were never lined up. I hope that. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, both of you. I think what came through, I see Mam Zorewa, Atikudzin, Ati Pamela there. Uh, communication in boundaries. We talked about that a lot. I think I spent a lot of time on that. I don't know what today's church is doing, but my church does surveys every quarter where we get to vent. I couldn't wait for the first quarter because I wanted to talk about this particular topic that I think was being avoided. So doing those surveys allow people to tell you exactly what they are thinking. Because sometimes we are uncomfortable to tell you things in your faces because you are our leaders. So I have found that in my church, when I get the survey, I really take my time and I'll sit down. I don't like this. I wish you guys could do this. And I know they sit down and they read those surveys. So I don't know if that's happening within our churches right now as Muslim churches doing surveys is an effective tool to get people's opinions and allow people a safe space to express themselves. It's anonymous. Some churches even hire an independent organization to do the survey so that people don't feel vindicated. That's when you hear the truth. That's when the truth will come out. I don't like this. I wish pastor could do this. That would be my suggestion. And also, you brought out the issue of mental health. I think I've, I'm feeling challenged in that because I think we don't do, Serena is children of God who follow our pastors. I don't think many of us do a good job of recognizing that the same that we're expecting our pastors to reach out to, they need the same thing. And I think this is a community. That's why I say this is a gap between our leadership and the expectations that the children of, of within the church have and how do we bridge that gap? We bridge that gap by communicating. We bridge that gap by finding each other. What, what, what is going on? What do you want? Our, our, my company just did a survey on race. How do our black people feeling? I could never tell my boss in his face the things that I wrote on that paper. Never ever in my in a lifetime. But I had the safety of my home. I changed my name was not anywhere. And I wrote everything down. And I saw it on a website. This is what people are feeling. I'm like, that was my comment. But my name wasn't there. So I would really encourage you to go on with technology, use doodle polls, use whatever you need to do. Find out what people are thinking. If something happened in a church, survey them. How do you feel about these two questions? And they'll tell you. I'm telling you, you will hear the whole truth the whole truth, some people will not respond, I guess it, but then, you know, if you get a 60% response rate, that's pretty good, that's good data. So that would be my suggestion. I think mine is Zorewa Dambo, I saw your name there. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you so much for such a powerful presentation tonight, Nekuzizisa. You know, we learned a lot. Um, the arrangement that got us here. Um, I'm not a pastor, but I'm a pastor's wife. <laughs> and uh, I think the uh, blessing for the day is how we can combine the, all the items that you were talking about. Because I think, uh, just like you said, my surveys, pastors need to know what the congregation is thinking about and not just always telling the congregation. Just like we do in the home as parents, we tend to tell our kids everything. But I think one of the <laughs> things that I 
could see was the uh, the time, the planning um, schedule that you put on there. If you could let your congregations also know what times to call you, unless it is an emergency. I think that that will put the boundaries that you need with your congregation. Let them know, please do not call the pastor after this time because it's an emergency. And let your congregation know. I know what my husband used to do when he was pastor. He had time to say, I will be in my office at such and such a time if you want to visit. And this was before my cell phones and all that kind of stuff. I will be in my office. So, and also, I think that helps a lot. And also in terms of setting boundaries for your, um, we live in a dynamic world, you know, even boundaries for every day for us, your congregants, we also, and nobody really knows whose boundary and all that. So I found one of the things that you said that really um, resonated with me was, you got to know yourself. So that even if somebody breaks the boundary, your boundary, you're not as offended as you would be if you did not know yourself. So the really everything starts with yourself because even you pastors, hey, you get it. <laughs> you know, when you're blamed, when you're thinking you're doing your best and nobody's appreciating. And even when we're helping our relatives at home and nobody's appreciating, we never get hurt as much when we know who we are. So I think that's where everything becomes. People don't know how to how to how to how to respect other people's boundaries. And sometimes they don't even know. And I think one time one time we were we were having dinner with my husband, and there was just this way that he was just irritating us, asking questions. I mean, I think he was trying to be overly nice, but it can be also be be irritating. And my husband was just, what, what is going? I said, bless him. When somebody when somebody irritates you, bless them but it comes from knowing who you are and whose you are. So that's where it starts. Everything else we can handle and all the boundaries can be crossed. I mean, <laughs> we'll be asking questions that we don't want somebody to ask, but we can handle it when we know who we are. This was just a, uh, especially Zoom, you know, you gotta know, you cannot attend all these Zoom conferences, you know, they're just becoming too much. Uh, so that plan is so helpful. Know what you can do at, what, at your time that has helped. I have a plan too for myself and it helps. I know 10 o'clock I go to bed, <laughs> you know, no matter what is going on. I get off the line or whatever, I go to bed at 10. Those are boundaries. And I'm, I'm healthier than that because of that. So um, as, as for my pastors, I also think when you're setting your boundaries, the way you communicate that to your congregation is very important. Have these sessions with your congregation so they learn. We have learned a lot. So. God bless everybody who is in the field as you try. It's not easy, but God will help us. Thank you very much. A really powerful presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mzorewa. I saw Auntie Pamela, then Auntie Kudzi, my Shurai. Auntie Pamela Beton, are you still there? Hi, this is Pamela. I'm so sorry. I'm on the road right now. I had to step out. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, Dr. McCorney, thank you so much for a powerful, powerful presentation. Thank you for teaching us so many things that we did not know. I was just going to comment about the pastors. We lost you, Auntie Pamela. She's probably talking. If you can hear me when you come back, just uh, raise your hand again. She said she's driving. All right, Mrs. Masuela, you could see any one of you. Response, because I think I lost connection. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I was saying I was going to speak on behalf of the pastors. Their situation is very, very tricky. I know because I work in a church side by side, my pastors, I am an assistant to my pastor. And when people don't show up to change, um, it's really hard for you to set your boundaries because you are also trying to know who you are. Like you said, we are of God. The pastor is a man of God. He has to do his father's work. He has to uh, shepherd the sheep. 
So you have to kind of, you know, be persistent a little because if they just say, oh, I don't know their boundaries, I don't know if this person wants me to follow up or wants me to be quiet, then they are also not uh, doing their father's work because we know that a lot of times when people are going through difficult times, they tend to isolate themselves. But I like the suggestions you are coming up about surveys and things like that. I think you go to a different kind of church, which is not a traditional Zimbabwean church, uh, where, you know, like people from this country, they understand these kind of things. But I... I think many, many of our churches, we've just tried into the kind of culture conflict. But for pastors, uh, knowing who you are, for me, I'll just urge you, go uh, to your father in prayer to ask for advice. This is when you really have to tap into the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you about certain individuals? Because God will talk to you. He will tell you what to do. So this is the boundaries for what you go to God in prayers. Speak to the Holy Spirit and He will guide you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you, Auntie Pamela. Um, this is my uh, yes, I I thank you, daughter. I just have you to add on to what everyone has said. Mainly, Panyedza, pastor, my pastor. Uh, what I want to say is, my pastor. I think me, uh, Dr. Mzorera did touch a little bit about it. We need to be, of course, number one, self-care. Um, and we, as, as human beings, we are so easily, or the culture, we're so easily offended. Um, and we are so confirmed to, I, I, I can't even explain how, because there's so much trauma, there's so much going on in this world. So the, we need to work on just our self-care. But just adding on to what she was saying, my pastors, please educate us. What is the pastor's role in the church? I've been in church. I've worked as a church elder, lay pastor of my church in Seventh-day Adventists. What I came to realize as church members, we don't understand. And we actually abuse our pastors because we are doing it not even knowing what are they doing? And some of the pastors in the church, they also had done and having a clear boundary for Isusu, my church members, to follow, to follow is so we expect we have higher expectations for them. And we clash. But there's nothing. It's just we need to be educated. And my pastors have to learn to delegate. Some of the things the ministry they end doing, I look back home in Zimbabwe. I live in Kushiamba, I grew up, I'm a rural girl. And I grew up in a church pastor with 10 churches he's running, doing all this work. You look at pastor kids, they're not even spending with their family because he's not delegating. He doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's painful to see what my pastors go through. But if we can invest our time educating church members, expectation and boundaries, which is, this is a great topic, to bring it back to our churches, I think this will be a great help for so many people. Thank you, thank um, you, thank you. Right. So, Dr. Marconi, we have some questions in the charts, a lot of them. So if you don't mind, we're gonna jump in with those questions. Sure. And the first question here says, how do I set godly boundaries with a, a partner or a spouse who is not truly a Christian? I'll do my best, but I'm gonna let I'll let the pastors take that one. Um, first of all, I didn't want to say that at the beginning because, like I said, I made the assumption that I know that most of us here are believers, but there are some who may not be believers. So, all I can say, because I'm not in that kind of a situation, and I deal with young girls, including my own children. I always tell them that that's why it's important to be not to be unequally yoked because this is when it really matters. So when you start talking about your boundaries from your church and I don't believe in the same things, that becomes very complicated. So at that point, I'm going to defer this question to the pastors. 
Thank you, Mama Koni. We have our pastors here. I'm seeing Reverend Mdambanuki. Please come on. Pastor Suluma, I'm seeing you here. Please come on in. I'm seeing uh, Pastor Ivy Akote. Please come on in. Pastors, come in. Let's help each other. Uh, Pastor Adonis, let's come in. Come in, chip in and help people. You are free. Quiet, uh, Reverend Mdambanuki. I see Pastor Chiaka as well there. Go in, come in. Anyone who is free pastors, chip in. <laughs> Pastor Adonis, we can't hear you. Your mic is low. Oh, hello, sorry. Uh, my phone is acting out, so I could not hear. Uh, oh, could thank you, you Reverend. I want to say. Okay. Um, thank you very much, my Makon. I, I got in when you were in the middle of uh, the presentation, and uh, I truly appreciate uh, the presentation. Very powerful. Boundaries are very, very important and pivotal in our faith journey. I just wanted to respond on now. Uh, I don't know which question, my Maka, you want me to respond to. Can you give a, a question? I didn't see any here. Oh, the Manjengwas, would you want to come in with that question again? Yes, I can repeat the question. The question Thank says, you. how do you set godly boundaries with a partner or a spouse who is not, a, who is not truly a Christian? Okay, so there are two things there. One, um, myself as a person, my, me as an individual, then the second thing is the relationship. So like my Makwani said, I just want to re reframe what she said. Um, the fact that I am who I am, I, I set my personal boundaries. I do my self care. I know when to pray and I know when to connect with my, my husband or my wife. That those are the set times that are there. So, but everything has to do with uh, maybe explanation, explaining to my partner, my boundaries. So the relationship is fundamentally built on boundaries. That's how we start. A lot of people, we get into relationship. It can be ministry, it can be uh, a spouse, it can be friendship, name it. As long as we don't uh, put a demarcation or set our boundaries straight, it becomes a problem. So we don't just hip hop in life. We, we, we walk step by step under that fundamental, that foundational uh, principle of having boundaries. That's what is important. I don't know whether I have uh, uh, connected well with that. Somebody can also chip in, but that's what I think. Personally, I can talk about myself. I know that I do, like I'm a pastor. I serve a church, and at the same time, I do uh, uh, I do other stuff outside church uh, in psychology. But at the same time, I know that as I work from Monday through Friday, I, I within that work period, I have my boundaries straight. I know when to say yes. I know when to say no. Last week, I had a, a scenario of a client who came and uh, he, was, he had breached everything that we had talked about. So I just told him I could not help him. That's a boundary there. He could have found somebody who was go, going to help the person. So if it is an inner relationship, honey, this is who I am. Uh, I, I, I go to bed at 7 o'clock. I'm going to be on the prayer line. And from the prayer line there, I know I have to be out of there. Uh, my certain uh, set times which are right demarcated well. So lack of boundaries makes it so harder. 
or it makes it hard for somebody to make some connections or to do anything. So the fact that somebody is not a Christian doesn't mean that we cannot, uh, we cannot set some demarcations or some boundaries there. We can make some boundaries straight, be it Chris, being a Christian or not being a Christian. Now, the other part that I heard was uh, it concerned uh, the leadership of pastors. Pastors help us in any denomination, in any ministry. It, it, even the, uh, with that, with that, within that uh, also, within the organizational ministries, I think teaching is very important. I always talk about teamwork. If you build your team, it makes it easy to set boundaries. We, without setting up a team, it becomes harder. You carry every burden, you carry every Tom and Dick within the ministry. But if we set teams and uh, uh, maybe assess the abilities or the skills within the leaders, it makes it much easier to work with people. So uh, boundaries are, are inevitable, boundaries are workable, boundaries are livable. Thank you so much. Powerful. Thank you, Reverend Mdamba Nuki. I'm just going to read something that I saw that goes in relation to what you're saying. I feel like, you know, I lead, like I said earlier, in my church, in the community, at work, and I found power and strength in delegation. Trusting people, trusting people that they can run with whatever it is that is in your brain. I found that when you take even the youngest person on our team and I say, I'm going to give you the responsibility to take this meeting because my son is a dental appointment. Oh, I, I can't do that. No, you can. And you just let them go. By the time they come back, they want to do it again. So it's mm -hmm. about trusting people, trusting people that if you are not there, life should go on with or without mm -hmm. you. The problem is as a leader, when you think that things cannot work because I'm not there, then you are burdened. You feel like you have to carry the whole world load on your head. So trusting people to do the things that you do and empowering people and allowing people to, to discover their own strengths allows for personal growth as well as community growth. So someone posted this, I don't remember. It says the role of a leader is not to come up with all the great ideas. The role of a leader is to create an environment in which great ideas can happen. So I feel like as pastors or as leaders, whatever you're doing in your life, empowering people is one of the best things that you can, you can lessen the burden on yourself. Mm -hmm. And therefore you are valuable only for what really, by the, by the time people look for you, they've tried to sort it amongst themselves. Okay, so-and-so needs food, let's take food. Ah, uh, this one, now we need pasta. By the time they come to you, they have tried to fix it by themselves because you have empowered them. There's a pipeline of leadership. So the role of a leader is to replicate leaders and create more and more pastor Adonis, to create more and more pastor Adonis is there. Not that you want to make everybody a pastor, but your skill set must be reproducible with or without. That is what makes a great team. So if you wake up dead, your ministry should not die. If you wake up and you are paralyzed and you can't do your job, the job, the work should continue. But if that work stopped, it means you were carrying everything on your head. Nobody mm -hmm. knows where you were getting the resources. Nobody knows what you were doing. And as a result, there's no growth. But the reason why we need to have boundaries is to allow for growth. I'm not trying to blow my own whistle, but I can tell you that right now I'm involved in a certain kind of the girls let's talk, but it's multiracial. It's got Indians and Japanese and Chinese, the same concept, but it's the same thing, older girls, same, and I'm implementing the same thing that we did with Women of Dominion and allowing them to run that thing with or without me. Oh, Dr. Magoni, you didn't show up, but we had a meeting and you see the ministry, like great job, everything worked out. That way you know that whatever ideas in your head can be reproducible across Hallelujah. the world. Amen. But if mm -hmm. your ministry is just within your house and you and me and I alone, I'm not sharing anything. I'm sorry. You can't pray expand my territory because God did not give you gifts to hoard gifts. He gave you gifts to impart them. Some Hallelujah. people are not born with gifts, but they are born for you. You have the gift so that you can pass it on. Some people don't even know how to lead a meeting. How are they going to learn if we don't let them? Hallelujah. Let them run the prayer meeting. Let them preach. Share your pulpit. 
Some people can't even share their puppets. It's my puppet. Nobody touches this. Take the lowest person, give them, empower them on a Wednesday, not on a Sunday. You know what? You've got the service. That's how I grew. I was just pushed to the front. You are leading the financial biblical. I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah, you are. Well, there are pastors in here. Yes, you can. Okay, Ongo, do you just do whatever? Then the next thing you know, ah, you're being given the whole project. Can you be more? Can you come and do this, this this Wednesday? Can you run this for us? The next thing you are teaching other people. That's how it's supposed to be. And I feel like our mm -hmm. our our Zimbabwean capacity or the, the, the Zimbabwean way of growing up has limited our capacity that way. As a result, the things we do do not grow because we hold the power. It's a power struggle. We want to be so powerful. That's not what it is about. We have to be mm -hmm. okay to hide in the back seats. When Amen. everybody knows that you've done all the work, but you should be okay not to take the limelight. The problem, want the, like limelight. the problem mm -hmm. we want to be seen, we want to be on big stages, but when you let other people get on big stages and you hide, God is a way of raising you up, back up, so that you can Amen. do it again. That would be my contribution to that. Okay, can I say one concept then I give to Pastor Adonis? My uh, American uh, mentor, taught me one thing. He said, and I always remember this, you have to lead invisibly. Mm. Build a team. Lead mm. visibly. Because, you know, with the American system, if you want to be always on fr in front and if you want always to dominate, he said, you know, you are spiritually strong and that spiritual aspect now is like a, to become a domineering thing. So people get scared, you know? <laughs> so learn to lead invisibly and build teams. And as you were saying, I thought about what happens within the family. If you, we don't teach our children how to cook, how to balance the checkbook, how to do stuff, the day you get sick, they don't know what to do because mm -hmm. mama is going to, is, and dad are always doing it or grandma is always doing it. Okay. So it, 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 it starts in the family system, then it branches into the community, it branches into the uh, churches, organizations, etc. Thank you very much. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Pastor. I see a few hands. Auntie Kuti has been, has been up for a while. Go for it. Okay. In Auntie Piola. Oh, oh, my hand was still up. I think I, it was still, I think I, um, when I put my hand up, it was about um, pastors going to people's houses and stuff. But my suggestion was, I just wanted to say that with my church, when the initial process, when you register to be part, a member of the church, there's that survey that my Makon, you were talking about. Even when you start, they ask you how you want to be contacted. And if there's somebody else in the church who's your friend or one that they could contact in case they cannot reach you. But so you know where to go right from the beginning so that you don't keep calling people. And it's not the priest who's going to call you. It's somebody else in the church. Right. right. So the priest doesn't have to come to your house. There's somebody, there's a department that deals with that. So you don't have to do all that. Absolutely. There was the, the, I think in my church, they call it the hospitality team. Yes, that's it. Happens yeah. And my family member is in the hospital or there's a death in the family. Each time mm -hmm. we experience a death, it was not the pastor himself, but there's a team that is mm -hmm. responsible and they all have geographical areas. So if I'm this particular zip code, this mm -hmm. particular guy and his wife are the ones who are going to come on behalf of the church. And because that's how we've been educated that, you know, I can't come to all your houses. So your leader for your area is this person. So I think it's the same thing. What I'm hearing, whenever we have conversations like this, personally, I call them community building conversations, kingdom kingdom conversations, according to Pastor Makai. They build communicate, they build our communities. So I feel like the ask, if I was teaching, I would say, so what is the ask? The ask is we've discovered we have a gap. There is a gap in the way our Zimbabwean community that came from Zimbabwe with a certain set of understanding of the church came here to try and replicate the same church in America where there's a different way of doing things. And now we are kind of struggling in this boat. Like, so what is the role of my pastor? What does my pastor do? We were just a little bit of, there's a confusion. But what I'm hearing is communication from both ends, from the pastors, from Isusu, we all have to, we have to communicate and talk about these things. Obviously this should not be the end of this conversation. 
in our smaller little groups. I think we need to continue talking about boundaries in our homes, in our ministries. And another gap I'm realizing, I hope, and I think it's already happening. There is a need for women in ministry to get together and talk about these things. There is a place for men in ministry to get together and discuss this boundaries thing. I think people will be able to help each other freely because I'm sure there are certain things here because we're different hierarchicals, you know, we've got our senior pastors, certain things might be a little like, ah, I don't want to say that in public. But if we're in a safe space where it's only the pastors, why? I mean, some, some female pastors, their husbands are not in ministry. That's a completely mm. different game plan. Some men, their wives are just the pastor's wife. So that's different. Those needs are different. So I feel like what this has done is expose the needs. What we need to go now, I'm just sending this back to the pastors. Where this needs to go is to break down the different groups and continue with the conversation in an appropriate setting so that people can be comfortable to really. There's a lot that's going on that's unspoken here because it's the problem, not an appropriate platform. But I think we can help each other as a community and build this new Zimbabwe that we would want to see as a church. Otherwise, our church is full of pain and hurt. We're hurting each other. Churches don't grow. Ministry don't grow. Don't grow. You're taking my people. Don't take my people. Because we're not, we're not together. We're not communicating. So that would be my opinion. The Auntie Piola, I think I saw your hand. Dr. Oh, Mako, before Piola you. speak, yeah. I'm just looking at our time. We really need to be able to touch on some other thing. Are there some questions I think uh, that is nothing to do with uh, the church that is a uh, personal. We, we want all of those questions to be asked. So to those who are going to be responding, let's be so brief. Uh, and also I am going to ask, um, I think pastors, there's a lot to talk about. So by the grace of God, we have our own kingdom conversations. So I think mm. because I think I am having I've got 15 contributions on my phone and I can't read all of them because of time. Thank you so much. Oh, that thank means you, the topic was good and it was, mm. it's a needed topic. You know, it's needed, it's needed each way you look at it. And it's, a, it's not something you learn one day. It's a growing process. It's a place of growth as believers. I don't think we can all learn it and get it, but we just have to continue with the conversations. Young moms, they need their, if you've got your little children, I'll use Piola as an example, your struggles with boundaries with the two little children are very different from my struggles, even though we are both mothers. I have children, I don't even know where they are. I only see them on Zoom. I don't even know what's happening. <laughs> so our struggles are very different, but we are both mothers. So I think that the need here or the ask is to break ourselves into groups and continue with this dialogue. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I think I, I had my, raise, my hand raised up for the, for the pastor's question. And so I was going to add something along on speaking about boundaries with pastors and their believers. I think um, I can I testify with what we have said in place in PCIC that it has been working where the pastor checks in uh, at once on the believers who have not come to church and then gives it to the rest of the leadership to do the follow up because sometimes, yeah, people then tend to say, oh, pastor is just calling me and calling me. But then when they see the leaders also making an effort and following up that actually sometimes uh, has an impact on those believers. And not only that, then the leadership is coming back to the pastors and telling the pastor, oh, hey, if you saw so-and-so not coming, it's not that they don't wanna come, they're going through one, two, three situations. So that's something that we can do in terms of also pastors trying to set those boundaries. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Makai. Um, I think I'll give over to uh, the Manjengwes. Uh, thank you, Pastor. So we have a question, but before we jump into that question, I'll just read a contribution on this topic from Pastor Ivy um, Apote. She's at work and she's not able to speak and give a contribution. So she's saying, just wanted to comment on the one speaker who was so honest about why they were not coming to church. As a pastor, I just wanted to encourage the church members to be honest and not play mind games, that the pastor will not know whether you did something wrong or if someone offended you. It's a two-way relationship, although we have to follow up. It's also good to call your pastor and explain. After all, we are supposed to be a family. 
surveys did not work for us. Um, for us, people did not respond. Thank you. America is difficult. When you keep calling some, when you keep calling, some do not appreciate it. It's tough to be a pastor. Mm. So that's the contribution we have from Pastor Ivy Apotei. Thank you for that contribution. And uh, my husband, Mr. Majengwa, will get us into the next question. Yeah, so this question says, someone is asking that, um, wh what are some tips uh, you have on communicating boundaries that you have set? Uh, sometimes the boundaries that we set, they lead to changed behaviors. So how much can we share about the change that we have made in our boundaries? Is it necessary to share about the reasoning for the change? So I think, the, yeah, I, I hope that makes sense. No, I understood you. So I came here prepared to talk about my own lived experiences. I found that to be an effective tool. And like I said, um, because we also do a, a marriage thing with my husband. So we talk about these things very openly and use ourselves as an example. I'm not the same person I was when I got married. I've been married for what, 25 years. We dated for four years. I've been with this man for 29 years. So I have to remind him sometimes I'm not that little girl that you made it, use it. <laughs> I have changed in some ways here and there. So the reason why it's important to communicate those changes is because the other person will understand why you're acting the way you're acting. Otherwise, if you just change, for instance, as a good example, I used to be able to stay through 1 a.m. and watch TV, watch shows, wake up at 5 a.m., go to work, wake up, gym, everything is cool. I can't do that anymore. And it took, it's a simple example, but it took explaining to like, look, my body does not tolerate some of these things anymore because I'll be wiped out for days. Oh, really? Yeah, it takes me a long time now if I exercise every day. It's four days down, four days up. So I have to do it every five days so that I can recover. So it's communication. Otherwise, this guy is thinking, what's wrong with her? Nothing is wrong with me. I've just changed. You know, I used to like orange juice like crazy. Would wake up in the middle of the night to go buy orange juice. Now it gives me stomach pain. I'm giving simple examples for him to understand why we don't have orange juice like we used to. Be. It's because some this lady something happened. She's different now. She's older. I used to love my husband's jokes. I mean, I would be rolling on the ground laughing, and now they irritate me. So. <laughs> <laughs> why because they sound too direct and maybe sometimes too true you know like i used to be okay to be called the let's say what old ah you're old you know in my 30s 20s i ah, who cares i know i'm not old but if you call me old now that might be a problem okay because i'm actually old so <laughs> so explaining why this is now irritating when i used to find it funny is important you know, so now it's a joke. Oh, I can't call the old lady old because she gets offended and we laugh about it. But at some point it would be like, ah, well, that's so unfair. Why would you call me old? Yeah, so you think I'm old. <laughs> I'm being truthful. So the reason why it's important is it helps the other person. It helps your relationship to grow. You grow into different places. I used to love going to certain places for vacation. I don't want to go there anymore. It's too much walking. It's too tiring. Let's do something else. Communicate why so that the other person understands. I hope I answered the question. Uh, thank you so much for that response. I don't know if there's anyone else who wants to come in before we jump to the next question that we have. That will be our last question before we hand it over to Pastor Rebecca Makai. All right, so this one is pretty loaded um, and it says, uh, how do I tell my mother to stay out of my marriage as a son? I feel like parents should allow us to make our own mistakes in marriage. Hmm. So that's the question that we have. And then I'll open it up for answers. We have a lot of married people here. We're all listening and looking to learn. Again, I'm going to share my lived experience. Dr. Makoni, before yes, you respond, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I think there's another question I saw sometime in the chat. Mm -hmm. of uh, single people who are not yet married there. If we can just join, I think it's the same. Mm -hmm. If you can look at about uh, parents, how, pa how about parents who want to be involved in our relationships before I introduce to them, what do I do? Something like, so we wanna join, these are married, 
this couple who asked is married, then the other cup, uh, person who asked, I think, is not married, right? Mm. If I'm correct. Yes, that's correct, Pastor. So this, the first part will be addressing people who are in relationships but not married mm. yet, which says, how, how about parents who want to be involved in our relationships before I introduce them into the relationship? And then the second part is, how do I tell my mother to stay out of my marriage as a son? Um, I feel like people should be allowed to make their own mistakes in marriage. So those are the two parts of the question. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Ms. Magic. I'm going to do my best to respond again from a lived experience. When we got married, we were informed by Babana Michael Gods. They were from the Catholic Church. Some people might know that they are our counselors. They told us that you have to communicate to your parents exactly what you expect and you have to communicate with respect. So I remember the day, and I kind of know what you call that, what do you call that after the wedding, you're dropped off. They were all there, the whole family. And my husband did exactly what Mr. Kukotze, our counselor, had told us. He got up and he said, I wanted to let everybody know, wait for it. This is my wife. This is who I've chosen. Some of you might not appreciate or like her, but she's not going anywhere. She's my wife. So we respect, we would expect for you to stay out of our marriage unless we invite you in. That is exactly what those people told us. And he told his family to this day, people respect our marriage. They don't just butt in because of that one statement. So this is, but we were fortunate that it happened in pre counseling So if you are not married, I encourage you to seek your pastors, seek your leaders, go for marriage counseling so that you can be given wisdom, wise advice. On my side of the family, Reverend Balangile, who was a Methodist uh, preacher, told us, went to their home, and he told us that nobody else has space between the two of you. Don't allow your families to get involved, and if they do, you tell them respectfully and nicely, mom and dad, this is my husband, and I, I don't appreciate those kinds of comments about my husband. We'll come to you if we need help. It's a matter, at least we were told it's about communication. It has worked for 29 years. Whenever we felt like people are overstepping, we always take a step back and we communicate. But sometimes it depends on the relationship with the son and mother. You can't get between that. You can't win that battle. If they never had that kind of a relationship, sometimes it's very difficult. I would let other people address. I'm just speaking from my own experience. And then to those people who feel like parents want to get involved in their relationship before they've been introduced, again, I think it's communication. Parents get what well, I have young adult children. Sometimes I'm nosy. I want to know what's going on. Hey, what's cooking? So what's up? What's up? But the, they tell me, ah, I'll tell you when it's time for you to know. So I just respect the boundary and I stay away. Does that mean that I stop being nosy? No, I'm still gonna, you know, knock a little bit. But if they, you told the same thing, it's it's unimportant. When it's important, I'll tell you. So I feel like it goes both ways. It's communication. Christian mothers, stay out. Were your parents involved in your love relationships? Children of today don't like that. So again, those boundaries, respect each other's boundaries. That's my own opinion. I see Pastor Donis. Uh, with your hand up. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mokoni. And I think I had answered in the chat um, to the gentleman who has a question about um, how does he communicate with the mother? And I think you have already touched on some of it. Um, I think it, it just needs to be communicated in love and uh, in respect as well. So, you know, mom is here thinking my son and then now she wants to butt in in the marriage, but it's now up to you, the son, to respectfully tell mom, explain. Sometimes it's lack of knowledge. Just explain what the what a godly marriage is. What is the expectation? Mom, this is how things are. And assure mom that you love her. She will always be your mom and so forth. Because sometimes it comes from a place of feeling like, oh, my, now my son is no longer loving me. He's now loving uh, this new girl or whatever it is. So as the son, communicate. Tell her mom, this is my wife, God first, my wife, and then, but I love you and you'll always be my mom so that there's, you know, 
basically communicate love and communication. And then for those that are saying they, um, they're in relationships and their families want to budget, it still boils down, boils down to the same thing, that you can communicate with your parents. And like uh, uh, Dr. McCorney said, as parents, some of us with young uh, young adults, you're, you're nosy, you want to know, so is there a girl, so is there, what's going on? And sometimes we're even praying because we are worried about what, <laughs> what kind of person you're going to get with. But um, I remember but I'll share my own experiences. When I was coming up as well, my mother used to say to me, I, I had a boyfriend at that time, and my mom used to say, ah, well, when are you going to take him to the pastor? When are you going to take him to the pastor? And I eventually said, listen, with all due respect, um, I mean, I've been dating this this year and this, this guy for, for a while, for four years or so of my life. And I said, listen, um, I will go to the pastor when it's time, when he's going to marry. I'm not trying to go to the pastor house three four times with different guys that's all I said and she said oh I said yeah so please don't ask me when I'm going to the pastor when he's going to the pastor I don't want to go and say pastor this is uh, John tomorrow I'm going pastor this is Frank tomorrow I'm going pastor this is uh, Thomas no I'm gonna go when I go long story short that guy never made it to the pastor's house <laughs> So, you know, so, so be, be communicate with your parents, tell them, you know, yeah, I'm in a relationship, but I'll let you know. Sometimes if you see that they're true knows, you don't even have to tell them too much about what's going on with your life until you know, this is what's going on. That's what I can share. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a very respectful uh, way of doing things. I mean, all of us cannot share what we don't know. So we're just speaking from, from experiences, from you know, for me, my parents only met my husband for that same reason, because I was like, ah, mm -mm, no, I just respected them so much. And sometimes if you tell them, I respect you and you're going to meet the person I'm going to marry, they'll keep quiet. <laughs> can I come in, Dr. McConey there? I'm so passionate. Uh, Rebecca, can I also come in after you? Yes, honey. <laughs> I'm so passionate about relationships. I want to represent two relationships, a godly relationship and a non-godly relationship. Mm -hmm. A godly relationship is totally different. Most of our young people or people are used to have been dating in the world before they are Christians. And we take that into church, but I want to differ slightly because when it comes to a godly relationship, um, we encourage our youth not to rush into a relationship till they give themselves time to pray, till they give themselves time to make sure they really want to get married. Mm -hmm. And we have fears that we say, when you get into a relationship, let others know. Let either your pastor or an elderly, someone know their, their disadvantages, and there are advantages of it. The first advantage is that your protection so that you don't sin against God because we want you to preserve your relationship godly. I'm talking about a godly relationship. We want you to, I talk more about this because that's what I know because I was a Christian. I never dated in the world that much. So I want to speak a godly relationship. So the reason why we say when you are in a relationship, don't make it too private. Number one, if we are dealing with the youth and they get in a relationship out there and the pastor is not aware or there's no elderly person who is aware to help these children to walk in a godly way, these are the disadvantages. Number one, you are likely to walk and walk and walk and sin against God. Or if you don't do that, things will not work. You, 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 you say, I'm going my way, I'm going that, that way. The other one will not come to church. We have lost a soul over the relationship. Or you end up by yourselves doing it the worldly way because your friends are also not believers. So you need that guidance in a relationship, not that boundaries come in. The boundaries will also come in. When you go to a counselor, or when you have, I encourage young people to have counselors before you get married. That's very important because when you have your counselor, it's not only going to the pastor, you can go to your counselor, 
you can you know introduce your boyfriend or your girlfriend to your counselor we have mentors in my church i teach about mentoring and i encourage people to be mentored it's very important number one is to your advantage because you are certain that a relationship is not like we know it all but sometimes we need people who come who rally around us who support us who pray over our relationship who tell us no you're going in the right direction or once in a while you have a disagreement you can say can you resolve this for us well, what can we do as the way forward and they say why don't you try this why don't you try that that's a godly relationship for me the reason it's not only that we want to know your relationship but we want to pray for you because we know how much the enemy is against marriages and relationships so we want as a church as pastors as leaders of the church we want to rally around you we want to protect you we want to take you there and we know with you if you allow it's not everybody but your mentor your 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 your, your counselor your pastor your someone you respect in church they can Amen. help you to get there that's what Amen. i call a godly relationship Amen. i cannot talk for the world relationship but uh, someone can actually talk about that one if they have an experience i didn't experience that so i'm talking for a godly relationship thank you i think dr uh, pastor saloma you're coming thank you thank you pastor makai and uh, dr makoni i just wanted to to just applaud what um earlier on uh, what uh, dr makoni said the word i that really like, spoke back to me because i have recently been practicing to say this is what it made me feel even with my husband and my children i have a 23 year old and a 17 year old daughter and so by learning to say this has made me feel what you have said has made me feel it's, um it came back to me and then I, it reflected it made me to reflect and so when my daughter one time when i was being nosy dr mcconnell one you just said i've been nosy and trying to see if she, who she going out with the see does she have a relationship is she in a relationship and so she spoke back to me said mommy what you are doing is making me feel like you don't trust me mm -hmm. and then i go back to what doc, to, to what uh, past, um, um rebecca just said like when i said oh i'm just trying to help you so that you don't make mistakes so if you can't speak to me maybe at least maybe try to speak to so and so one of the church members or one of the elders or you know or one of your friends so that I, at least i know i'm not trying to be just nosy but i want to protect you but the part of speaking back, of setting those boundaries, it still, it, it still is important. At the same time, you want to tell them that I want you to be protected. So I think maybe I'm not sure, but I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to connect those two points of boundaries, how you make me feel, what you are doing to make me feel, feel like uh, you are trying to, to not uh, to divert or to not, you know, you, I don't feel respected as your mother if you don't tell me about you what's going on in your life and then at the same time you want to to respect them as well so they're setting boundaries and i'm setting boundaries so that tends to be a little bit confusing when you when you bring the two together anyway that's i just wanted to bring that up thank you thank you pastor Sloma. i think these are such powerful powerful conversations that's the beautiful thing about these conversations because they they bring out a lot of information that we need as a people as a community and I just want to speak to those people with younger children. There are so many things that I wish I knew when my children were younger. If nothing else, the phase of life that I'm in right now is taught me to trust God, to trust God more, that there are certain things I'm not going to ever know, but God knows. This phase of my life is because I have older children now, I don't see them in their bedrooms, I don't know what's going on. It has made me trust God more. However, if you have an opportunity, if you haven't started the family yet, the relationship you want to have with your children when they are older, when, you leave, when they leave your home, begins when they are little. If you didn't have a relationship where you communicated and things were talked about openly, there was no rebuttal for telling the truth, or you're not getting slapped for being honest, don't expect that to change when they're 25 or when they are 40. Maybe you're here, you've got children my age and the relationship is so bad. It was probably bad when they were little. That's something that I have learned as a mother 
and as a, you know, all the things that I do, whatever relationship to the young moms that you want when your children are in their in college, in high school, be, begin to fight, to, to ask the Lord to give you the wisdom, not to become your child's friend, but to, to, to nurture a relationship that grows into an open relationship. You know, I have one, my children are a little bit different. One will just call and just tell you TMI, they say, boo. One will just keep it a little secret. You have to create the moment for you to hear what's going on. They're different. But maybe what I'm now trying to do with the one I have an opportunity with is to nurture a relationship, an open and safe relationship. If you make a mistake, if you cross a boundary, I'm not going to start yelling. I'm not going to get my belt and whoop you because you made a mistake. I might whoop you and then tell you why I whooped you and then I still love you. But because of what you did, it deserved this kind of punishment. It's all things I did not do before because of my upbringing. So if you have young children, learn do things right, do it so that you are nurturing a boundary, lovingly boundary full relationship that you can enjoy when you are in a nursing home and your children are sitting where I'm sitting right now. The same relationship you're gonna have then, it begins today. Dr. Makon, I see uh, Pastor Mateta there and um, Jackie, I want to ask them young couples like, like can you come in and help us, help us just say something? The Matetas. I also saw the Chiakas, I don't know where they went to. Are they in a pl safe place to speak, the Matetas? My, my, I know my Mateta is working. So she had said she was going to be there, but she's in a work situation. Ah, okay. All right. That's That's okay. Is working as well. No, that's okay. It's not good place, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I would also want to ask someone from the experience of um um if say you know we know that our children are dating uh people from our um and who are not uh, part of the church uh or uh we may not be Christians. Do we have advice that we want to give to them? Um, what are the expectations? Um, um, okay, we said we've got people who are Christians here and people who are non-Christians here. What, what, what are the expectations? What, how does that work? Can we give advice that there are people who want to talk about such relationships? Don't be intimidated by the one I talked about, the godly one. I also want to hear the other side. It helps us how to um manage our children when they are in a relationship with someone they are christians but they're in a relationship with someone who's not a christian how do you um for some people we have experience can you please talk to us thank you i saw their hand auntie grace they've got their hand up yes thank you very much it's 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 this is really encouraging and so powerful and so good to see you auntie maudi <laughs> Um, so I've got an, a son who's, he's, he's, he'll be 30 on Monday. So he's dating a, a girl from Zimbabwe as well. But this girl has had a lot of misfortunes in her life so much that she backslid. And she, she decided that how can God be like this? Because what happened was she had gone to a concert with her mom and her mom just collapsed and died there. So she just fell out with God, I mean, if, I, if I were to use that word. So she struggled and my son was saying, so mom, what do we do? And I say to him, you just need to show her love. You can't Bible bash her, you can't point and, you know, raise the guilt. And in so doing, she's actually come to realize that, you know what? This is something that lacked even in her own upbringing. You know, she had just given her life to Christ and, she, you know, the misfortune happened. So just loving on them, you know, showing them who God is through your acts and not just, you know, preaching, but just leading by example. You know, the people will know you by what you do, not what you say. And I found that she's come back to, you know, to rededicate her life to, to Christ. That is so powerful. I don't see any other hand raised, Grace, so I will go after Auntie Grace there. That is so powerful. Sometimes you are the only Bible 
that somebody is going to read. And I, by that, I mean, we have to live our lives as believers in a way such that people will see Christ by the way we do life. Just you doing your life, managing your little business, make, make people around you see Christ, even those people who don't know who Jesus is. May they wonder what's, what's different about this one. Something is different. May they wonder because of just the way you're doing your life. So may you be the Bible in that relationship. If you think that this is the relationship that you want and this person grew up in the church like the one that we just heard, the spirit of God is in them. The Bible says some, and the Apollos, Apollos, I poor planted, Apollos watered or the, or the opposite. It was in the process of God who was doing all the growing. Sometimes we have to decide what do we want. I'll share my own example again. When I met my husband in college, he had kind of gone away while I grew up in the church. He was, and he was a boy who read the Bible in church, the whole thing, went to campus drinking and all these things. And when I saw him, I said to myself, this is a very good guy. But I don't like this drinking stuff because I was in the church. So I didn't tell anyone in my friends that I was dating a guy who was busy doing some stuff because I knew my friends would rebuke me. So I didn't, I kept that a secret for a while. And then I just started, I would just do my thing. And then after a while, he started following me to church every Sunday. He's following, I'm thinking, okay, he wants the girl. That's why he's going to church. Then I saw the mom on fire for God. She has no clue. The boy is busy on campus. And then I just kept doing my life. By the time four years came to an end, I could see, I, I cannot claim that, but I could see that just following and following and wanting to be around this girl who goes to church, who is with this very strict band that I was called an ATM. Like, oh, she's an ATM. This one, if you put the wrong password, she's not talking to you. So after a while, I saw a change. My husband doesn't do any of that stuff. He's in the church and people know him. But when we met, I thought we just some of my sisters in Christ said to me they knew him in the church. There was something going on on campus, so he's a good person. So I hung on. I'm glad I did. So I'm saying this to say, just do your life. If you think that this person is, is you know, when you have the spirit of God in you, something in you tells you things. I don't know how else to say this. Help me out here. When the spirit of God, the spirit of God that is deposited, the Bible says the spirit of God is the deposit of what is to come. So if you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the spirit of God is in you, there are certain eyes that you have. Use those eyes. I'm talking to both male and female. Pray that God open my eyes so I can see. Should I hang around this person or should I leave? Is this a relationship that is going to lead me to church or is going to pull me out of, out of my faith? It's your responsibility as a believer not to be unequally yoked because there are disadvantages. You mm. know, there are certain people I met along the way that I would be like, hey, did I met that person. Oh my goodness, my goodness. Mm. But now I thank God that that thing in me told me that no, 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 for ministry to happen, this is it. And for sure enough, we do things together. We're in the church together. We do things. So I'm just saying this to say, if you are a believer, man or woman, trust that spirit of God that is in you. If you're in a relationship and something is grieved in you, something tells you this is not it, get out. Don't wait. Don't wait until you've done too many things and you're ashamed to get out and you're stuck for the rest of your life. It's not worth it. So if you're in a relationship and it's not godly and you know it, please get out before it's too late, before their children, and it's so complicated, leave. Go, let go direct you to the right person. If you're already into it, and you feel like, how am I gonna get out? I would like to, hopefully, pastor will pray at the end for those kind of relationships so that you have the wisdom to know what to do. There's no shame. Mm -hmm. God is a forgiving God. If you've done things in a relationship and then now you're like, if I leave, people are gonna judge me. Remember we said, don't let people's emotions and thought processes influence the decisions that you make. May your decisions be based on who you are. Maybe you are living a life that you know, this is not the life that God wants me to live. This is not what I was created to do. This person is not a destiny builder. This is a destiny destroyer. I need to get out, get out. It is never too late. It becomes too late when you let babies come and all these things. Then it becomes very complicated. But if you're not there and you can sense it, 
I'm telling you, go talk to your pastor, pray and leave. It's okay, you meet somebody else who can be a destiny builder where God can use both of you for his ministry and his kingdom. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Makoni. Back to the Njimanjengwas. Amen. Thank you so much for that uh, powerful response. It has been a very powerful discussion and uh, we wish we had more time, but we'll definitely schedule more discussions in the future. So at this point, I just want to give this time to Pastor Rebecca Makai to take over, to, to get us into the next segment, the next thing that we're doing, and then we'll move on from there. Over to you, Pastor. Oh my, it's such a, a painful, uh, what do you call it, exit to do. <laughs> because I think we had so much to talk about. I would really wanna take this opportunity just to thank you, Dr. Makoni. You touched on every area. Um, uh, I know we had, I know I saw the young generation, uh, they just left, but um, it touched almost every area. You touched our, our young children, you touched our um, youth, our teenagers, you touched our married people, parents. I mean, thank you, thank you. Boundaries are so important and I'm not going to take much of your time because I want to leave this time to Pastor Adonis so that she can pray for us. Um, you know, we also need the help of God. Some people we are dealing with relationships that are broken. Some people we are dealing with issues that we don't know where to start. How do I deal with my parents? How do I do with my in-laws at this point in time, in this situation? You don't know where to turn to, but we just want, um, we cannot leave God out because he's the one who brought us out here to do this for the word of God says in Jeremiah, 30 verse 17, but I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord, because you are called an outcast Zion for whom one cares. God cares for us. So if you are here and you just feel like, I don't know where to start, I don't know what to do, I want you to uh, just uh, hold on for a few minutes. We'll be out of here exactly on time. Just hold on Head over to Pastor Adonis. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Makai. Thank you, Dr. Makoni, uh, and all the <clears throat> and all the contributions that have been given uh, here. And as I was just sitting here and just listening, uh, this boundaries discussion is very important. And I'm looking at uh, God, the Father, uh, already is, is the one who started with boundaries. Amen. Even in the Garden of Eden, He said boundaries. He said boundaries and says you can eat of every tree except this tree of knowledge of good and evil. So there are boundaries. So I would encourage everybody to go into the word and see what are the boundaries that, um, that the Lord has set for us and how we, we ought to handle uh, our lives. I'll just give two scriptures. I'm not going to preach, but I just want to share. There's uh, Proverbs 25 and verse 17, um, which says, withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee and so hate thee. This, this is just to show that God is just so uh, involved in the intricate details of our life. The Bible is saying, don't go to your neighbor's house all the time. The neighbor will end up <laughs> hating you if you're knocking, knocking, knocking every time. So there's guidance there. And in Colossians 4 verse 6, we're told, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how, to, how you ought to answer every man that's a line of boundaries that by the word of god we have to ask the lord to guide even our mouth and how we speak to everyone and from what i gathered here uh this afternoon most important thing as christians as child of god relationships whether they are with uh, spouses that don't believe whether they're dating relationships and all these relationships that were stated today um the key thing is to operate in love as children of god and communication with respect amen i think that's that's how i could wrap up i was really touched by the person who asked the question about um being married to someone who's an unbeliever how do you set boundaries and it's just love respect respect and communication because do you know that as you do that they may come to Christ and there's some people I've seen people where they're serving God they're doing what they can because God has already set the boundaries of marriage of how a husband should operate how a, a wife should operate and if we seek him to guide us in those relationships whether the spouse is saved or not 
things will flow smoothly. But uh, this afternoon, I just want to go before the Lord and let us come together and agree and pray uh, for all these challenges um, that, that we face and to the one who has all the boundaries, to, to the one who has given us his word, which is the manual of our lives, regardless of where we are in our Christian uh, walk. So let us just go before the Lord and pray over, his, over all these uh, boundaries and uh, everything that we have learned this afternoon. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we honor you. We thank you, God. 